Uh, good evening, Pomona. At this time, I would like to call the meeting of the City Council, Housing Authority, and Successor Agency to the Redevelopment Agency to order and turn this time over to the City Attorney for a report on the closed session. Thank you, Mayor, members of City Council, members of the public. We did have two closed session items um, this evening. Both were matters of pending litigation as listed on the agenda, and there is no reportable action on either item. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, we will adjourn this meeting to a meeting on Monday, August 3rd, 2020, that will take place via teleconference. Closed session items will be discussed at 5.30 p.m. The open session will commence at 7 p.m. Uh, on March 16, 2020, the City Council declared a local emergency in response to the global COVID-19 outbreak. Preserving the health and safety of our employees and the public is our top priority. In accordance with the Not California that. Governor's Executive Order N-25-20, regarding the Brown Act and guidance from the California Department of Public Health on gatherings. This meeting is taking place by teleconference. Tim, you went on mute. I'm not sure why that happened. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Uh, in accordance with California Governor's Executive Order N-25-20, uh, regarding the Brown Act and guidance from the California Department of Public Health on gatherings. This meeting is taking place by teleconference. Council Chambers is closed. The public is accessing the meeting via the Pomona Internet Streamings channel on the city's website. The council members and I, along with the city manager, the city attorney, city clerk, and executive team are all in different locations. Please bear with us as the technology may disrupt the flow of the meeting. The agenda has been modified to accommodate the needs of a council meeting that is teleconference. At this time, I'd like to ask everyone to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please place your right hand over your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the, to flag the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America and, to and to the republic, republic for which it stands, which stands one, nation one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you, everyone. At this time, I'd like to ask our city clerk, Rosalia, to please call the roll. Council Member Gonzalez. Council Member Preciado. Here. Council Member Garcia. Here. Council Member Altiveros Cole. Here. Council Member Lastro. Here. Council Member Torres. Here. Mayor Sandoval. Here. Thank you. And the next item is a presentation. Next item is a presentation by the Pomona Police Department on the Eight Can't Wait campaign. I'm going to share my scheme screen real quick. Is that visible to everyone? It's good, Mike. It is, Chief. Okay. All right. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, we have a presentation tonight on the Police Department's use of force policy and the eight can't wait campaign. Uh, oh, hold on one second here. Okay, uh, first we're gonna start off with, um, I wanted to share with you the department's mission statement and its core values. Our, the department's mission statement is to commit to a high level of police services and security to the citizens of Pomona through the reduction of crime. The police department is an organization of caring professionals who deliver service to the community in a realistic, sensitive, and positive manner. And we also value the pursuit of organizational and personal development. Our core values, uh, we are professional, transparent, approachable, respectful, problem solvers, community builders dedicated to an improved quality of life for the city of Pomona and dedicated to implement strategies to reduce crime and disorder in the community. As you know, we've had several protests in the city and since May 25th, the Pomona Police Department has assisted with monitoring a total of 19 protests in our city and in surrounding cities. Uh, to date, we have had zero uses of force related to these protests, 
and we have received one citizen's complaint, which is being investigated. Our stance, the Pomona Police Department stance, sorry about that. Sorry, I'm having technical issues here. <laughs> this is not as easy when it's on screen sharing. Uh, the Pomona Police Department will also will always support peaceful protests, and we are dedicated to conducting ourselves in a professional and compassionate manner while working with large crowds. Our primary goal is the safety of the public, and our presence at protests is to ensure that a safe environment is maintained for all. Uh, the eight can't wait campaign so on june 3rd the city received informational emails about the eight can't wait campaign uh, that day the mayor asked for a presentation from the police department on where we stand in comparison to the eight can't wait campaign eight can't wait stemmed from a research paper published in september of 2016 by samuel sinyangwe he studied the 100 largest police departments in the united states and he examined eight policy areas related to use of force and deadly force for each of those cities. A little statement about the police department's policies and procedures. We've contracted with a company named Lexapol since 2007. Lexapol provides our policy manual and provides policy updates several times a year based on legislative updates and best practices. Officers are able to access the manual online and from their smartphones 24 seven. And all of our policies are available for the public to view on the police department's main webpage. So a few things to note here before we get into the eight can't wait. Um, police officers operate according to department policy, obviously. It's also important to note that police officers operate according to state and federal law. And we are in California, which makes a difference. Uh, last year, actually two years ago, effective last year, AB 392 and SB 230 modif modified use of force laws in California. And these laws are currently models for other states in the country as they work through their own police reform efforts. So the eight policies of eight can't wait. Uh, their stated policies are ban choke holds and strangle holds, require de escalation, require warnings before shooting, exhaust all other means before shooting. Uh, there's a duty to intervene, ban shooting at moving vehicles, require a use of force continuum, and require comprehensive reporting. So I'll go through each of them one by one. Uh, the first being banned choke holds and strangle, strangle holds. This includes what's called a carotid control hold. The carotid control hold was an approved technique in our policy manual. And on Sunday, June 7th, California's Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training decertified all training statewide associated with the carotid control hold. That same day, Pomona PD immediately suspended the use of the carotid control hold and we updated our policy manual, removing it from the manual. So it's no, no longer an approved technique in the city of Pomona. Item two, required de-escalation. This in California was affected by AB 392 and SB 230. Uh, De-escalation training, we provide that to all Pomona police officers regularly. SB 230 requires that officers utilize de-escalation techniques, crisis intervention tactics, and other alternatives to force when feasible. SB 230 also provides additional statewide funds for de-escalation training. Uh, we, Pomona is actually being considered for funding as a regional training center that would include a training simulator on shoot don't shoot scenarios based on the language in SB 230 and AB 392. Uh, Department-wide de-escalation training was first provided to officers in 2017. And as I said, we have continued that training since then. And in 2019, 
post began requiring de-escalation training at the police academy. So that training begins as officers are going through the police academy as they start their career. Uh, in our own policy manual, de-escalation is referenced 10 times. And uh, I currently started a committee in the police department is being headed by the deputy chief. And we're looking to update our policy manual in areas where we can more explicitly articulate de-escalation. Item number three was providing a verbal warning before shooting. Uh, that's covered in our policy manual as well as the penal code. And from our policy manual, where feasible, the officer shall, prior to use of force, make reasonable efforts to identify themselves as a peace officer and to warn that deadly force may be used unless the officer has objectively reasonably gr reasonable grounds to believe the person is aware of those facts. And that's consistent with California law. Item number four, exhaust all alternatives before shooting. This is covered, this was covered in AB 392. Our policy manual says if an, object, an objectively reasonable officer would consider it safe and feasible to do so under the totality of the circumstances, officers should evaluate the use of other reasonably available resources and techniques when determining whether to use deadly force. Number five, duty to intercede. Our policy uh, directs our officers to do that. Any officer present and observing another officer use force that is clearly beyond that which is objectively reasonable under the circumstances shall, when in a position to do so, intercede to prevent the use of unreasonable force. Number six, ban shooting at moving vehicles. Uh, our policy, uh, this policy is a little tougher um, because we're trying to provide guidance to the officers in policy, but also accounting for any number of scenarios that could occur. So an outright ban on moving vehicles is, is not necessarily something that we can do. And I'm sure there's plenty of examples you can think of as to how that might be a problem were we to do that and then people might get hurt. Um, but our policy does say that shots fired at or from a moving vehicle are rarely effective. Officers should move out of the path of an approaching vehicle instead of discharging their firearm at a moving vehicle or its occupants. An officer should only discharge a firearm at a moving vehicle or its occupants when the officer reasonably believes there are no other reasonable means available to avert the threat of the vehicle or if deadly force other than the vehicle is directed at the officer or others. An officer should not shoot at any part of a vehicle in an attempt to disable it. Number seven, require use of force continuum. Use of force continuums were removed from policy manuals decades ago. Uh, there's, there's several issues with them. And uh, the Pomona Police Department's uh, way of documenting how to use force is consistent throughout the state and with AB 392 and SB 230. Uh, PPD's arrest control tactics program utilizes a use force paradigm rather than a continuum. A continuum applies that one must exhaust lower level force options prior to using higher level force options. A paradigm allows an officer to choose the appropriate level of force based on the situation while following policy which dictates we only use that amount of force that reasonably appears necessary. And number eight, require comprehensive reporting. Any use of force by a member of the department shall be documented promptly, completely and accurately in an appropriate report, depending on the nature of the incident. And the officer shall articulate the factors perceived and why he, she believed the use of force was reasonable under the circumstances. And just to note, all use of forces are reviewed by the chain of command and the chief's office. And just some additional information uh, for the council. As I said, use of force is uh, largely directed by state law and federal law. And there are currently 25 police reform bills being considered by the California state legislature right now. 
Um, as I said, we do have a committee in house on de escalation and how we can improve our policy and identify additional department training needs. And then soon we will begin the mayor's task force on police reform and accountability. And that was the end of the presentation. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. I think what I'd like to do is just go down each, uh, ask each council member if they have any questions or comments uh, for the chief. So I'll start with you, council member Preciado. <clears throat> Um, right now, you, you mentioned that you have an in-house uh, department um, that works on de-escalation. Um, would you guys happen to be able to release whenever you make changes and give us updates on those? We could, and anytime we make a modification to our policy manual, we put it on the website as well, so the public would have access to those changes. Um, just want to say thanks for, for listening and, and attempting to uh, make changes and, and making some changes. And I know that you're, we're going to be working on continuing and making some more. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Garcia. Good evening, Chief. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Um, Chief, I, I guess I want to acknowledge a couple of things that concern me. Uh, I do acknowledge that police are constantly changing, laws are constantly changing. We're always trying to do um, a little bit better than before. But I, I believe that what caught my attention for this presentation in particular were section six and seven of the eight can't wait. I, I hope the police and your staff understand how incredulous or how surprised you know, regular everyday non-police residents would be at police balking or hesitating at banning shooting at a moving vehicle. In my mind, there's greater, op there's greater opportunity for residents to get hurt if there's a shootout on a street. And that's when I, when I hear shooting at a moving vehicle, that's what I imagine. So I, I do want to acknowledge that that's, that 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 is a, a hard pill to swallow, that we can't change that, or that that should be really looked at more closely. And, and I do want to say that. Uh, for number seven, I, as an English teacher, I completely understand the, the use of vocabulary and the changing of terminology. And so I, I appreciate that instead of continuum, we're using a paradigm, but that's definitely something that the public needs to be made aware of. Um, I. I appreciate how hard being a police officer is. Um, I have a cousin who is LAPD. I have a friend who's a 911 dispatcher in another city. I understand the, the urgency when there's an emergency call made, but I would still like for us to continue to look at it from a resident point of view and to further communicate and educate and work together and compromise on these issues. And I, I think that's all I have to say for today. Thank you so much, Chief. Okay. Chief, do you want to comment on uh, Council Members uh, Garcia's point about uh, item six? Yeah, um, so it's difficult because police policy is there to guide and help officers make good decisions. But it also has to account for endless scenarios. So. When you think about shooting at a moving vehicle, uh, I guess one example that we worry about here with large crowds, uh, like the, the truck in France on Bastille Day driving through a crowd of hundreds of people. And if an officer has the ability to shoot into a moving vehicle to stop that vehicle from continuing to run people over who have no way of escape, there's a scenario. So it's, it's I understand the shock and seeing, uh, seeing that in policy, but there has to be a way for some scenarios to be uh, to be dealt with. And generally the policy is telling officers do not shoot at vehicles, but there is uh, some language in there when you're dealing with certain situations. So that's an example. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Councilman Anavera's Cole. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, Chief Ellis, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I hope that we have plenty of citizens who are watching this tonight to give them some clarification. 
and uh, also um, the mention of the chokehold is no longer in practice for the Pomona PD, which is very, I think, very um, important for the constituents to understand and realize this. Um, as time goes on, I'd like to see more presentations uh, on Zoom, uh, maybe have some special presentations that you feel would be really um, uh, favorable for our, our, our city and to give more education for our constituents. A lot of our constituents have a, um, a very negative, uh, uh, how do I say, a very negative uh, attitude maybe uh, regarding the police department as a whole. So if we can work together at this and we can establish some type of um, um, uh, presentation from time to time as you build uh, more um, uh, different types of policies and uh, this will help our constituents. I wanna be able to bring that to the city. I wanna be able for our youth to understand the policies of what you mentioned here and as we go on, you know, that they would be able to uh, learn more from the police department that uh, police are our friends, not our enemies. So thank you for the um, for the presentation today. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Lestro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Chief, for the uh, uh, the presentation this evening. Uh, it, as you went through each uh, each point of eight can't wait, uh, I, I believe it, it it answered some of my questions uh, with respect to what some of those bullet points covered. So I so I appreciate you. Uh, uh, explaining all of those, and I, and I guess I just want to say that it's it's somewhat reassuring uh, that uh, the current department policy uh, does uh, does cover um, several of those bullet points right now. Uh, it sounds like there's you know maybe a little bit of work to do, but uh, I'm uh, I'm happy to know that uh, the the policy that we have in place, as you were saying, uh, much of which mirrors uh, state law. Uh, is 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 already in place, so that's uh, that that is good to know. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Torres. Yes, um, Chief. Question: um, How much community outreach has been done? What has been the response from the community? Given that this is um, this issue here has been uh, um, propelled by the community. Um, there's a high engagement rate when it comes to this particular issue. Um, and I understand that the city is a uh, collaborating in how to make the uh, new policy changes as we move forward. But what is the, the feedback that we're getting from the community and what is your plan in terms of how are you going to make outreach, um, given the COVID pandemic situation, how are you going to gather input from the community so that, whatever proposal comes forward from the city staff or the police department actually solves the problems uh, instead of just, um, you know, solving the issue uh, only by name. So, uh, because what I'm worried about is that we're gonna move forward, take some votes, and then at the end of the day, I'm gonna continue to hear uh, more issues from the community about things that we did not include, things that we, not, we did not do, um, so I want to make sure we avoid that and I want to hear from you exactly what is your plan in terms of bringing, um, you know, all people from all parts of Pomona to the table, not just, you know, the politically elite, but everybody to the table. That's a great question. Uh, obviously with COVID-19, our community meetings, you know, were to a grinding halt. Uh, and when we have topics like this, there is a lot of feedback I get from the community. Um, this Wednesday, we are uh, we, we, we thought about how do we increase our outreach in this COVID situation that's obviously gonna be around for a while. And this Wednesday, uh, we're starting with a Facebook Live event. I'll be there, the rest of the command staff. We're announcing that we're gonna begin doing the outreach, neighborhood watch meetings, area commander meetings, and meetings related to this topic using Zoom and Facebook Live 
the ways we can get out to the community. So that's kicking off this Wednesday night at five. Um, and so as we, as we move through the mayor's task force, as new state law is approved at the legislature level, um, that will obviously change our policy. And I do plan on getting feedback through uh, the online methods that we have available to us. So hopefully that should alleviate your concerns. And, and you, you want to add anything, Councilman Torres? Is that, are you, you good? Okay, I'm not hearing from you. Yeah, Chief, thank you for the uh, presentation. I do want to say that, um, you know, when the eight can't wait came out, uh, it was um, shortly after, um, it may have been out there much longer, but in terms of, I think when many of us had learned about it was uh, after uh, the um, killing of uh, George Floyd. And I know uh, myself and I would imagine other council members received a ton of emails asking us to look at our policy on the eight can wait. Um, I just want to make it clear that it was not intended as a, okay, this is what we're doing. This is all we have to do. Therefore, if we do this, this is somehow going to make the police department the absolute best police department. What I, what I, what I was interested in knowing is in looking at those eight, are we doing them? Are we doing any of them? Are we not doing them? Why are we not doing them? So this allows for, in my view, a conversation about perhaps things we don't even typically look at at the council level. And it gives an opportunity for the residents to be able to see an example of a group that has some ideas on what police uh, departments can undertake. Um, and, per, and, and in our case, to actually explain what we do, what we don't do, or what degree we do it, right? right. Like shooting at a moving vehicle. So I think from that standpoint, I just want to clarify that this was not this was not seen as okay. We're just going to do this and move on. Uh, it was just a, an opportunity for us to be able to uh, give our police department um, uh, the chance to explain what we do. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, the second thing is is that um, in speaking to you know how do we get better, right? How do we improve? Uh, how do we understand what we're currently doing, right? Where do we need to go? And, and I appreciate, Chief, that you and uh, the police uh, men and women uh, have been open uh, to uh, change uh, so that it isn't a adversarial or antagonistic relationship. It's a working relationship. It's a cooperative relationship. It's an opportunity for us to absolutely produce and to build the, the best police department. And so the mayor's task force is just uh, one effort uh, to look more deeply at what we do and to make recommendations. And I can tell you that it's going to be very inclusive. It's not just going to be those who are selected uh, who, for this task force. Uh, and these are people from all over the city, but it's also going to be, you know, people are going to be given an opportunity to participate uh, in some capacity during those meetings. They'll be able to walk, they'll be able to see them, they'll be able to, in other words, they'll be able to call in uh, and there'll be an opportunity at the end uh, of the meeting for them to ask questions. Uh, also, if they have ideas that they want to submit, they absolutely can submit them uh, so that anyone who is a member of this community will have an opportunity to do that. Um, I also want to just bear in mind that, um, you know, it's a time, there's a time frame for this, uh, and we're going to accomplish as much as we can within that time frame. Uh, but if we need more time, because the task force believes we need more time, then we'll certainly undertake that additional time because we want to make sure we get things right uh, so that any recommendations that become come before the city council are really well thought out uh, and are, 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 are the types of kinds of changes that we can make to, to, to improve our police department. So Chief, I just want to thank you for that um, and, um, and we'll go from there, okay? Any other questions or comments from the council before we move on to the next item? Tim, can I ask one more? Sure. Chief, um, why is it that we go through Lexapol, or is that just a, a, instead of having our own manual, or or is it that we go through Lexapol as a base and then we adjust it as as we see fit? Yes. Uh, obviously, police policy is changing with every law that passes. They have uh, lawyers on staff that write policy and make recommendations to us. 
we review it and make sure it's uh, good for our agency and our city before we approve it and push it out to the officers. So they basically provide the baseline and we do modify it quite often to either rec uh, reflect what our practices or if there's uh, ordinances or anything else in our city that we've adopted that may uh, change our policy. So it is a recommendation that ultimately I approve. And then um, I don't know if this is towards the city attorney or the city manager or city clerk, but I was just curious, why did this come in up as a presentation instead of like um, a discussion item? Is this, is this typical? I can explain that. Okay. I, I, had, I, had, I had asked um, the chief um, during one of our uh, meetings uh, if he can update us on the eight can't wait. I know that the, that the police department put a, um, uh, a post, I think it may have been on Facebook or other social media, and he provided a written update on eight can't wait. And I think I, uh, in speaking to James and Mike, uh, Chief Ellis, I should say, I said, you know, I think it would be good for you to present uh, the, uh, you know, your, 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 um, uh, your, your findings, if you will, of, of the eight can't wait. So that, that, that was, that was, it was on that basis with your, or Council Member Preciado. Thank you. Yeah. And, and certainly any recommendations in the future, uh, and it could include some elements, it can't wait would be a discussion uh, amongst the city council members and the public. Okay, if uh, we can go ahead and move on to the next item, Rosalia. Okay, next item is Mayor and Council Member Communications. These are reports on, on conferences, seminars, and regional meetings attended by the Mayor and City Council and announcements of upcoming events. Okay, Council Member Torres, we're gonna start off with you this time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, residents of Pomona for tuning in uh, to another city council meeting. Um, please continue to practice uh, social distancing and wearing a mask. We're seeing an increase in COVID cases and infections, uh, particularly in the city of Pomona. Um, please look out for my uh, mask and uh, hand sanitizing wipes giveaway coming out soon. Um, planning to make outreach to residents of Pomona and District 6 um, in an effort to uh, stop the spread, as you may call it. Um, but other than that, I just want to continue to encourage folks to contact me. Um, engagement is uh, very high. Um, please continue to send me messages and emails regarding your feedback, regarding all the city issues. Um, if there's something that I need to be taken care of, um, pothole issue or graffiti removal, or um, if you're having an issue in your neighborhood, uh, don't forget you can contact me via email and phone. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Torres. Council Member Lestro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just want to uh, uh, say to everybody, I hope uh, everybody is doing okay, staying healthy. Uh, it seems like that seems to be the order of the day. Uh, over the last few months. Um, I just want to uh, uh, recognize a couple of departments uh, in the city. Uh, first of all, um, uh, water resources. Uh, as, as many of you know, we had our, uh, our own uh, uh, special geyser uh, a couple Saturdays ago here in District 5, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a tough one, uh, but uh, water resources staff was out uh, uh, late into the Saturday evening, and then uh, we're back the next day. Uh, to do the repair uh, of the, uh, uh, the water main break, which uh, actually occurred on private property. Uh, so I appreciate all the, uh, uh, the diligent work that, that staff did on that one. Uh, I know uh, uh, just up the street from my house, we had a gate valve uh, in the street um, uh, blue uh, last week, and uh, staff was out there again, uh, digging up the street, doing the repair, and uh, they did a uh, did a real quick job of that. So, so Chris, please pass along to your crews that uh, uh, residents appreciate the work that they did. Um, and then um, uh, Public Works Department, um, uh, appreciate the, uh, uh, the quick work that was done by uh, staff last week after the, uh, uh, a pursuit by San Bernardino County Sheriffs uh, uh, ended, ended in our community uh, with the, um, uh, 
the, the death of a signal pole and a, uh, and a uh, fire hydrant, uh, which did, did a little bit of damage. But uh, again, uh, staff was out the next day and uh, got um, uh, those utilities fixed and operational again. And so uh, that was very much appreciated. Uh, and then I just want to uh, let you know, Renee, that uh, I'm already hearing uh, uh, words of uh, um, happiness, or I guess uh, how you want to put it, uh, with the uh, street work that's uh, beginning uh, on Scenic Ridge Drive uh, and also in Mission Hills Estates. So the, I just want to let you know the residents are, are very appreciative of that work. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lestro. Councilmember Ronaveros Cole. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you're, that you're able to attend our meetings. I know it's not as exciting as it used to be, but, you know, as long as we're here together, we're learning from each other. And uh, I still can't, as a nurse, stress enough the importance of uh, taking the COVID-19 seriously. Uh, on July 14th, Pomona had 2,292 2292 patients that were uh, infected. It is now up to 2,763. So what does that tell you? That tells you that we're not taking it seriously. We need to wash our hands, put our masks on, have a six foot distance. Um, you know, if you're sick, stay at home, don't go out into public. I know it's very boring. I know it's very hard for everybody, but we need to practice this. Um, also, um, I, you know, again, Public Works is always really doing their part for the city. Every time I send emails, thank you, Renee, for um, really taking my emails seriously and um, looking into certain things that are very important for the city. Jerry Perez, Sam Lama, all these fellows, Hugo from Code Enforcement, Diane. I mean, I am so thankful to have people that are so uh, on board with us during these times and uh, the, the constituents appreciated too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Ronaveros Cole. Council Member Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just because the city, uh, just because of COVID-19 doesn't mean there aren't things happening around our city. Um, as my colleagues have mentioned, our city staff is working every single day to and make sure our city is fixed and repaired and up to date. But there's also organizations that are doing some amazing work in our community. And I just want to, um, as this, I guess, second second phase of Safer at Home continues, I do want to recognize a new program by day one called Vamos Pomona, which is encouraging safe distancing, but still going out there, being cooped up is bad for our mental health. So please, um, if you can, participate in Vamos Pomona from day one and follow the safety guidelines. And speaking of mental health, if you are, if you're in need to talk, if you're in need of uh, decompressing or just sharing what is going on in your mind, Tri-City Mental Health Services is available in the city of Pomona at this time, as is the House of Ruth. In case you are um, experiencing abuse at home or anything of that nature, and also, of course, Project Sister Family Services is available for um, for therapy and other services for child abuse or sexual assault, um, sexual assaults, as well as being part of our human trafficking um, solution here in the city of Pomona. I also want to recognize that we're having lots of little free libraries installed throughout our city at this point in time. So I would highly encourage that with safety measures, uh, you all, if you need a book while our library is closed, to please go check out or get a little free library book. And lastly, I want to thank Pomona's COVID-19 Action Committee. This is an initiative started by our mayor uh, comprised of assorted community groups. And it just goes to show what I've always known. We may all have our different missions. We all may approach a problem in a different way, but when it comes to making Pomona better, every single community organization in our city is willing and able to work together. But I would really like to thank especially Mayor Sandoval and the city of Pomona for their leadership, Senator Connie Leva, Assembly Member Freddie Rodriguez, and of course, Supervisor Hilda Solis. Things are tough, especially in a community of essential workers and people who live paycheck to paycheck. And so as things have gotten worse, our residents are reaching out to us more 
and I have reached out to the action committee and the various groups in the action committee, as well as the elected officials I've named, and they've all come through for our residents. So I just want to thank everyone for their time and their effort and recognize that we're only going to see this through if we stick together and we work with each other willingly and without agendas to move forward. So thank you all very much and please stay safe out there. Thank you, Councilor Garcia. Real quick before you uh, move on, can you also just share that I understand that um, you uh, jumped about six feet high from uh, while you were at the library uh, because of a mural that was placed in the library. Can you just speak briefly to that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, I definitely jumped six feet high because there is a new mural installed in our Pomona Public Library, and that mural will be there for the children to see and parents to see when the library reopens, hope, hopefully sometime soon. But it was a labor of love that uh, began when I was a resident, then a Library Board of Trustees Commissioner, and definitely came to fruition as I'm a council member now. So it was several years. So I do wanna thank the Cultural Arts Committee as well as staff for establishing an easier process in order to bring art into the city of Pomona. I want to acknowledge our wonderful artist, Athena. And most importantly of all, I want to let everyone know that the children that you see on the mural in our library are currently children in our city. They're gonna come back in five, 10 years and see themselves still as little kids on that mural. And that just brings special joy and most importantly, ownership of our library to our to our residents. So yes, I jumped six feet high and if I could have floated around the library, I would have. So thank you very much, Mayor, for, for pointing that out. Thank you, Councilman Garcia. Councilman Preciado. Uh, yeah, so we've got, we've got a couple things going on. Hello, everyone. And in, in continuing about speaking about art, uh, in downtown Pomona, we currently have a project going on in partnership with the Alley Gallery, um, who is Giovanni Esparza, my arts commissioner, and as well as Article Partners and myself. And we started an event called 31 Flavors. So if you get a chance, go down there with your mask on. And every single day in the month of July, we have a different artist painting a four by four mural around um, the fence uh, next to Sean Diamond Plaza. Uh, today being the 20th, we have a, a little bit over 20 panels because on uh, the, the last, the uh, second Saturday, we actually had four artists participate. And there's artists at all levels, um, men, women, um, college grads, high school kids, all the way up to uh, uh, lifelong artists that have been working on it forever. It's a beautiful sight to see. Go, go, uh, if you have an opportunity, go check it out. Um, as well as I would like to thank everybody and all of the volunteers that came out to uh, help uh, continue to beautify the garden that is being uh, built over at Tony Serta Park. They have uh, uh, sectioned it off between vegetables, wildflowers, and as well as plants such as succulents and trying to stay as native as possible. Um, we had an opportunity to carry uh, truckloads of rocks on there to create uh, divisions and divide the, the garden in a beautiful way. Um, you know, uh, thank you very much to Carlos Goitia for that, for allowing us to be in, uh, helping us find those rocks. And then Fabian Pavon, the Parks, Parks Commissioner, who has been leading the efforts. Um, as well as I, you know, I haven't mentioned it in, uh, in a while, but I'd like to thank everybody who has been helping us do food deliveries around the city of Pomona. And I'll be posting a little, a few things later tonight, just showing about how our, our effort has done done and um, I'd like to thank God's Pantry for providing the food for our residents. Um, to date, we have uh, we have delivered to over 20,000 residents in the city of Pomona. So I appreciate all the volunteers that wake up early and help us uh, deliver. Tomorrow we have 260 uh, families that are, will be receiving a, a, a meal delivery and we do about 400, 450 a week. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Councilman Preston. Uh, you know, just a quick question for you. Can you speak to the food distribution on Saturday uh, with God's Pantry and um, Mario Ramos and the uh, LA Care program? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you aware of that? Actually, I, I am not um, helping with that one. Okay, okay, okay. I'll make sure that we get the information that everyone needs. Uh, that's gonna be, I believe it's this Saturday uh, over uh, at their center on Holt. 
Okay, um, I don't really have much to add, just to say thank you uh, to all the council members for the work that they're doing. Um, you know, I, I, I do wanna just restate that, um, I mean, I know this is an incredibly difficult time for so many people. Um, we're clearly seeing the numbers of known cases going up in Pomona, and I, and, I, and I really think it reflects this community because there's so many of our community members who are essential workers and they're on the very front lines and they're exposed. Uh, and we know, we know from the data that um, working class communities, communities of color are being adversely impacted uh, by this uh, terrible, terrible virus. And so I know there's um, folks who have very differing opinions about masks and social distancing and uh, maybe not so much washing your hands, but it's really so critical that we continue to look out for each other uh, and understand that the decisions that we make have an impact on each other. I, I, I've been wanting to get out and clean on Tuesdays uh, and Saturdays like we had been doing prior to COVID-19. But many of the people that were a part of the uh, Pomona Beautiful are in their 60s, 70s, uh, and perhaps maybe in early 80s. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, we protect them as uh, much as possible, uh, given the situation. So I just want—I just want to thank everybody who's just stepped up uh, for each other, uh, whether it's food, uh, whether it's housing, uh, whether it's even still there's still some folks cleaning up, <laughs> trying trying to keep up uh, as, as as difficult as it can be. So uh, just just I, I just ask that the residents of Pomona and our business community, uh, to the degree that you can, continue to look out for each other. With that, we move on to the next item. Okay, next item is city manager communications. These are reports from the city manager. Nothing at this time. Thank you, James. Uh, next item. Rosalia. Next item is public participation. In response to the global COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the California governor's executive order N2520 regarding the Brown Act and guidance from the California Department of Public Health on Gathering, Please note that comments for public participation or for a specific item on the agenda were accepted by email only. Comments will be read into the record by the city clerk. The deadline to submit the comments was 6 p.m. today. All comments must be limited to 200 words. And right now I'm gonna have a development services director, Anita Gutierrez, she'll be assisting me this evening with reading the comments that have been mailed to the city clerk's office today. And I'll start with the first comment. First comment came from Hank Fung. Mr. Fung says, Dear Mayor and members of the City Council, I would like the City Council to begin initiating creation of a civilian police oversight commission similar to the models currently being considered in Pasadena and Fullerton. At the Charter Review Commission, the City Attorney said that they were concerned about a big city commission structure, but Pasadena is a similar sized city that is also exploring implementation. I do not support defunding the police, but rather reforms in police training and discipline when officers are found to act beyond the law or policy are necessary to increase public trust in the police department. The time has come for oversight that will be a model for other cities in the San Gabriel Valley and Inland Empire. Thank you. From Fabian Trevon, good evening, Mayor and Council. The Latina Latino Roundtable of the San Gabriel and Pomona Valley has partnered with the Liberty Hill Foundation for Economic and Environmental Justice through the Empower Program. Empower is a coordinated LA County-wide outreach program with the mission to overcome barriers to sustainable energy usage commonly experienced in low-income and working-class communities of color. Empower matches household needs with local and statewide resources to help residents maximize potential savings and use of available incentive programs by one, ensuring that low-income households are taking advantage of available financial aid options, Two, promoting low or no cost energy efficiency programs, solar panel installations, home improvements and appliance rebates to meet basic energy needs and save even more on energy bills. Consult and number three, consulting with residents to determine the feasibility of clean vehicle or transit and shared mobility vouchers with trade-ins of older high polluting vehicles. We would love to work with the mayor and the council in order to help low to help income eligible Pomona residents save money and move towards being more energy efficient. Please feel free to share and connect with me at any time. Next comment is from M. Joyce Baker Smith. Dear Mayor and Council, this email is to voice my concerns about the commercial cannabis permit program. 
in reviewing information on the city website and listening to concerns from residents at council meetings, the process used by the consultant company for granting permits can easily be manipulated to offer unfair advantage to out of area and non minority owned applicants. The system can be manipulated to create a monopoly. The applicants who qualified for phase three included Authentic 909 LLC, finishing first in both micro business and storefront retail, Ash Pomona LLC, finishing second in micro business and 12th in storefront retail. To make the cannabis businesses in Pomona more diverse, companies should not be allowed to apply in more than one category. The applicants should be rewarded for being locally owned. Informational meetings are at different times. It would be better for the public to be able to see all the candidates at a forum, making it easier to, to compare the benefits each would bring to the community. Please take another look at the process and the applicants. I am concerned we are not creating Pomona businesses. We're only creating unfair monopolies in Pomona. Next comments from Virginia Madrigal. Good evening, Mayor Sandoval, council members. A person's home is supposed to be their castle, a place where you enjoy the time you spend with your family, a place where your children, grandchildren, and other family members can get together and feel safe. This should not be given to this this is should be given in the United States of America, afforded to all who want to enjoy the freedom that many Americans have given their lives to protect. This also includes elected officials. Unfortunately, the respect for their privacy in their homes no longer exists. It has been replaced by those who call themselves advocates for social justice. What kind of social justice is there when a person or a mob of people stand in front of your home screaming their demands, or when someone breaks the windows in your home? That's not social justice. It's antisocial behavior. This behavior has caused their message to be lost and any support they might want. They are, there are many places to present their point of view. Some, someone's private residence is not one of them. Whether you're a mayor, council member, district attorney, member of the House of Representatives, or a private citizen, your home is your castle where you and your family have privacy and safety. Next comment is from Benjamin Wood. On July 5th, Pomona PD shot and killed a 34-year-old man in the city of Chino. The department released a 37-word message on social media to acknowledge the incident, but nothing else. Neither the victim nor the shooter were named. The circumstances of shooting were not disclosed and still have not been. Post has investigated this matter and have identified the victim, Matthew Dixon. Say his name. He was a family man with five children. He was from Tennessee and had and had, had a little bit of trouble there, but, he, but had turned his life around in California. He was involved in ministry and was studying to become a youth pastor. I was spoken with his mother and two close friends and his widow. 15 days after the incident, they still have no answers to basic questions. Posts in the community have big questions too. The same questions we consistently ask you. Our elected officials to ask of law enforcement. We need you to ask those questions tonight. Matt Dixon's life matters and he had family and a community that loved him. They have given us their blessing to invoke our rights under the PRA to demand answers to these questions. We demand the video and the officer's name be released. Next comment is from Daryl Cruz. No lives matter in Pomona. What matters in Pomona is money and the connections and influence that come with it. Like council member Robert Torres said, friends and longtime political allies who helped get him elected to office. It's those friends and longtime political allies who matter in Pomona. Generally, those are groups of people who come together to get someone elected to get them favors at the expense of others. In Pomona, it has led to injustice and has resulted in ignorant and hateful treatment of those without influence. It has resulted in unequal treatment of people performing the exact same service just doing at different times. City Council, their staff and enforcement personnel ignored the will of the voters and legislators and forcefully abated some operators in the past, causing injury to some. City Council recognizes that the city, the service is legal and was legal when a previous city, a previous council caused enforcement of its pre prejudicial ordinance, which was based on hate and lies and ignorance due to the stigma that has accompanied it since the days of referee madness, reefer madness. Uh, remember that stigma was based upon racism and lies and you refused to fix the damage done by previous council. Next comment is from Joe. Dear Mayor, City Council and staff, in follow-up to previous requests, the residents asked that the city advocate and provide periodic updates to residents about the lack of representation in District 1. 
How do we find out if Rubio Gonzalez remains on the council and who do we turn to for representation of District 1? Given the circumstances, we understand you are limited on what you can, you, what you can share. However, District 1 deserves trust and transparency, along with valid and competent representation. Please make this a priority and do not have residents wait until the November election for a solution. Also, can the city please share with District 1 residents uh, on how we can find information and learn about council member candidates for the upcoming election? Thank you. From Clay Johnson, I am a Pomona resident living in District 4. I am writing to ask that the city identify the officer who killed Matt Dixon on July 5th and release information about the incident. It has been over two weeks since the, since the incident and the public should have a right to this type of information and full transparency about our police department. I would also like to request the city support for establishing a police civilian oversight committee with subpoena power to ensure fair accountability of the police to the citizens that it serves. And our final comment for public comment, for public participation, is from Elizabeth Trejo. My name is Elizabeth Trejo, and I'm writing in response, or I'm writing in today, to ask for transparency in the police-involved shooting that cost Matt Dixon his life. His loved ones deserve to know what caused the Pomona police officer to use lethal force. They also deserve an independent investigation that is not conducted by the very same department that caused the death of their loved one. I also ask members of this council to strength, strengthen community relationships with police and put forward civilian oversight over the Pomona PD. And that's, that's it, Rosalia? Yes, it is, Mayor. Yeah, before we move on to the next item, I just wanna address three things briefly. Uh, the first one, um, a, a resident made reference to protest and so forth um, at uh, elected officials, residents, and certainly protesters have a right to protest. Um, I, I want to just make it clear, though, that the incident that happened at my home had nothing to do with protest. It had to do with a transient who I believe was dealing with mental health issues. And it's a situation that we have in our community uh, where you have people who are unfortunately on the streets dealing with real health issues when perhaps they should be getting other types of support. And so I just want to make that clear. There's, there's no, from, from my view and uh, from my lens, um, I don't associate the two at all. And I think it's not fair to associate the two at all. And so I just want to make that clear uh, because I certainly respect the right of people to protest however they may protest. Uh, it isn't always easy to experience or to have experiences like that, uh, but I do just want to acknowledge that. Uh, but they are, they are two separate incidents altogether. Uh, and the first one, maybe incident is the right word, but they're, they're just two different things altogether. The second thing uh, has to do with District 1. Uh, Rosa, uh, I'm sorry, um, Sonia, if I could ask you, um, it, you know, can we provide just some kind of update or, um, you know, what can we do to just share with the residents what, what limits we have and what we can and can't do? Because I don't want, I don't want people to think that we're trying to ignore them. Um, you know, because I think that um, if we had our, um, uh, how might you say, uh, I think everybody would like to move forward and to move on. And I think we have made it very clear that we want council member Rubio Gonzalez to resign and to resign immediately. But can you just, just walk us through briefly so that people know this is not just something we're uh, just waiting on uh, just because we want to wait on it, but there's, there's, there's rules and laws that we have to follow. Otherwise we are subject to being uh, Sue. Yeah, Mayor, I'd, I'd be happy to do that on your behalf and behalf of the entire city council. I'd like the public to know that immediately upon um, discovering and learning of the charges that the council member was facing, that the council took immediate action in the form of censoring him. Um, to date, this council member does not have access, um, unfettered access to city hall, doesn't have access to city paid equipment, and all that he has today is basically the fact that he is a council member elected by the people within his district. Um, under California law, there are, there are significant protections for people who are elected by the people. And those same protections that help ensure that when the people speak and elect someone, we can't just have a seven member body, or in this case, a six member body, remove someone from office. So the state law provides extreme protections. And so what the city would have to do in order to remove a council member is go through a state process. 
unfortunately, if you have an elected official who um, attends a council meeting, as you have had in this case, um, this uh, council member can attend a closed session or open session meeting and under the city charter remains a valid member of the council. So at this point in time, the council member is a valid member of the council. We have very little legal recourse that we can take um, and we have to allow the process to carry itself out. But I hope the public does understand that this council acted immediately and took, you know, charged me and said, what actions can we take? And you took every action at the civil level that you could take so far. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we, we absolutely appreciate your concern. You should have a council member. Mm -hmm. You should have somebody that you can call that could help you through the challenges that you may be facing. And so I think a number of the council members at the last meeting said they're willing to help. And I think I shared with, um, uh, with, with, with on, 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 our, on our Zoom call, I, I shared with the public my number. If you live in District 1 and you have a concern and I can be of help, I'm going to give you my number again. I think I gave it at the end of the meeting last time. It's 909-762-1982. 909-762-1982. You know, in our system, we have district, we have district council members, and then you have a mayor. And the mayor is not just responsible for one district, but his entire the entire city. But I tend to think of district council members as also being responsible for all of us. And uh, to the degree that they can, I know that they're willing to step up to help uh, because I know they've stepped up to help in the past. Uh, so we don't we don't just keep we just don't keep ourselves in our districts. Um, we actually go across districts all the time because this is Pomona, uh, but we're here to help. And just the last thing, Chief, uh, on Matt Dixon, uh, can can you just provide the degree that you can where we're at with that process? I know that in the um, officer involved incident. Uh, over uh, prior to that uh, is that the video was released uh, based on based on the law it's it's supposed to be released after a certain period of time but can you just tell us and walk us through just briefly uh, with this particular individual uh, who who um, uh, Matt Dixon uh, what what exactly happens uh, from this point forward so the officer involved shooting occurred uh, we immediately asked for it, it occurred in san bernardino county uh the chino police department responded and the san bernardino sheriff's department we asked them to conduct an, uh, an independent criminal investigation as we we do even if it's in la county they will uh, review the incident for uh, any criminal issues and the district attorney's office also sends attorneys out to review the incident so uh, two years ago, AB 748 was passed, and that's a law that requires uh, police departments to release body-worn camera video and audio recordings within 45 days of the incident. And how we do that in Pomona, we prepare a community briefing video that we share uh, on YouTube, and we send it out, the links out on our social media platform. We are preparing that community briefing now, and the questions that are being asked, the name of the officers, uh, releasing the video. We are already uh, in production of that video to be released as soon as it's ready. How, how soon do you anticipate something like that coming forward, Chief? Uh, we've done one before and it took us 30 days to prepare everything because there's a lot of evidence that needs to be collected from the other agencies and be prepared for the video. So, so we can anticipate something within 30 days? Yes. Okay. That's and then the family and just the family, um, reaching out to the family, connecting with the family. Are you at liberty to talk about that? Well, obviously it's a tragedy. The man had children. I completely understand uh, the family being upset. Um, it puts us in a situation where we are being technically investigated by the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. And that agency is the liaison to the family at that point. Um, so uh, if anyone is, uh, you know, asking questions, it should be going to the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department at this point. And, uh, and that's, we're, we're kind of limited in what we, the information, right. we have, what we can say. So what you're saying, Chief, is you're not investigating yourself. There's a, another body that does the investigation, um, which is, which is what happens in all officer involved shootings. So I understand right. it. Yes. Okay. Okay. All righty, Chief. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, if we can go ahead and uh, move on to, uh, 
the next item, which is consent calendar. Consent calendar. All matters under the consent calendar may be enacted by a single motion without separate discussion. If discussion or a separate vote on any item is desired by a council member, that item may be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. All consent items pulled for discussion will be limited to five minutes. If they are not acted upon within five minutes, the mayor will move that consent item to the end of the, of the agenda after consideration of the public hearings. Any motion relating to an ordinance or a resolution shall also waive the reading of the ordinance or resolution and include its introduction or adoption as appropriate. And we do have two speakers for, com or for item number seven. Mayor, you're on mute. Thank you. Are there any council members who would like to pull an item from consent for discussion? Uh, not hearing any. So we're, so we'll pull seven. Okay. And, uh, cause we have two speakers and yep. then what I'll need is just a motion for the rest of the consent calendar. Yeah. Okay. I have a first by council member Lestro and a second by council member Garcia. And we, Rosalina, will you roll call? Sure. Uh, Casmar Preciado? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Oliveros Paul? Yes. Castro? Yes. Torres? Yes. Mayor Sandoval? Yes. Okay. Uh, item seven, uh, there were two speakers, correct? Yeah, so item number seven is the adoption of a resolution in support of the First Amendment rights to peacefully assemble and protest and the ongoing review of law enforcement practices and policies. And the first speaker on that item is Benjamin Wood. Benjamin Wood says, once again, we have empty words on the issue of police violence when you could be taking action. We don't need a resolution in support of the First Amendment. We have an amendment to the Constitution for that. And while it's true that the power of the PPOA and PORC make it difficult to fire officers, too often it's not an issue of law, but of political will. Reform needs to happen, but it should uh, be named rather than remain vague. The Peace Officers Bill of Rights needs to be repealed. It gives one profession more rights than other people. Frankly, a pretty clear violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Let's name it and let's, let's take action here where we can, rather than again attempting to pass the buck Sacramento. And the uh, second comment is from Daryl Cruz. The City Council of Pomona wishes to give lip service to the cause of police reform by allowing you to protest during a pandemic. You can't have an outdoor, you can't have outdoor get togethers in your own backyard and barbecue, but it's okay to allow thousands to get together in great, greater numbers with less distancing. It is without logic to allow this and, um, excuse me, not expect people to think that it is safe to get together. People doubt the severity of the pandemic when you don't endeavor uh, to protect those people so, so stupid as to assemble in that manner. Protect these uh, morons from themselves. Government is full of mask debaters. They claimed we did not need to wear masks in February and March when they make it mandatory. Why are government people always so useless and good for nothing? It's much better to not talk about something you know nothing about. That's what you get when you have a socialist community organizer leading the health department rather than a medical doctor. She has no clue and will continue as a mass debater. Darwin's law are being replaced by socialism. That can't be good for the country to be continued. That was the final comment, Mayor. Thank you, Rosalia. Uh, does the council want to comment on this item? Mayor, if I could. Yes, go ahead. So I do want to thank city staff for um, helping to draft this resolution. I understand that residents are eager for action to occur. However, as city attorney, uh, our city attorney has made it clear to me on several occasions, there's only so much we can do before we open ourselves up to lawsuits and retaliate. Um, and I guess I wanna say um, to lawsuits and, uh, and just complications. Yes, it would be great to pass laws and count other things as uh, no longer valid or illegal in our city, but then that opens us up to lawsuits and the invalidation of those good practices. Um, we do this with goodwill 
it is not the only step. It is not the first step, but it is a step. And as it was pointed out earlier in the presentation, there is going to be a committee to discuss all of these. There are going to be opportunities for residents to be involved. So I do thank um, my fellow council members as well as staff for their support and drafting of this resolution. And I would like to move to approve and of course, welcome the comments of my fellow council members. Are there any other comments from the council? Okay, we have a motion on the floor to approve. Uh, a motion on the floor to approve. Uh, can I get a second um, from the council? Second, Mayor. Okay, we'll do a roll call. Councilmember Preciado? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Antiveros Cole? Yes. Astro? Yes. Torres? Yes. Mayor Sandoval? Yes. Okay, we can go ahead and move on to the next item. Next item of discussion, calendar item number 11. It's the introduction and first reading of an ordinance to add division three wireless facilities and right of way to the Pomona City Code chapter 46, article nine, adoption of a resolution to establish fees for wireless encroachment per, uh, permits. That was article four, my apologies. Um, it is recommended that the city council will take the following actions. And we do have uh, one speaker for this item tonight. Okay, do, and do we have a staff presentation? Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Just a, a real quick uh, introduction. Uh, this is an introduction and, and first reading uh, to this ordinance, which uh, will establish a process for managing requests for the placement of wireless facilities within uh, public rights of way and uh, create uniform stand city standards for installation and implementation. Uh, this proposed ordinance is consistent with the city's obligation to promote public health, uh, safety and welfare, to manage the public's uh, to public rights of way and to ensure that the public is not inconvenienced by the use of the public rights of way for the placement of wireless facilities. Uh, this city also recognizes the importance of wireless facilities to provide high quality communication services service to the residents and businesses within the city. And the city also recognizes its obligation to comply with applicable federal and state law regarding the placement of personal wireless services service facilities in its public rights of way. Uh, that's it for the presentation. <coughs> we have uh, uh, lawyers or attorneys from BBK present uh, in case there should be some questions that I cannot answer. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, uh, Renee. All right, I understand we have one speaker. So for the council ways in, uh, Rosalie, can I circle back with you and have you read the um, comments from the speaker? Sure. Uh, comment is from Larry Ortega. Mr. Ortega says, the city council must step in to protect the residents of Pomona. The ordinance must require wireless companies to ensure for injuries and illnesses caused by RF MW radiation exposures from proposed cell towers antennas. Our research uncovered the following. Lloyds of London, Swiss Ray, AM Best, other insurance companies exclude coverage for injury and death claims from RF EMR exposures caused by cell towers, 5G antennas. The city council should insist demand as a key component to this ordinance, specific RF EMR pollution coverage from the applicants via this proposed ordinance. The ordinance should mandate the applicants to disclose exact corporate uh, name and its board of directors and that the insured matches the corporate entity on the application. The ordinance should require the insurance associated with the application come from a licensed third party insurer not from a self-insured indemnity substitute. In the case of Crown Castle, a wireless tower and antenna developer, we discovered through their financial statement filings with the SEC, they are financially over leveraged, carrying a high amount of debt. According to one ex expert, a former investigator with the SEC, they could not make good on any claims were one to be filed, leaving the city with ultimate financial responsibility. That's the final comment. Thank you, Rosalia. Uh, let's go ahead and have uh, the council weigh in. Uh, they may have questions. I'll start with you, Council Member Preciado. Um, Renee, just as a clarification, this is just to adopt a resolution to establish the fees, right? This is not 
putting any up up uh, at this moment. All of any, any wireless facility that will be in the right of way will come to uh, to the appropriate uh, bodies uh, in the future. Correct. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember, for the question. Uh, this this staff report is uh, covers two things. It's twofold. One is that it, uh, it's the first reading of an ordinance that uh, should it be approved after the second reading will provide the framework and establish standards for permitting the installation of wireless facilities within the city's public rights of way. The resolution will actually establish the fees involved with that. So then uh, if we're if we're establishing standards, can we add to the standards that are currently in place or, or, or being presented to us? Or are we following like, for example, a federal uh, standard or state standard and we pretty much have to follow that standard in line? I, I will turn that answer over to uh, Minister McCardo from uh, BBK. Hey, good evening, Council. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, Andrew McCardo, an associate on the telecom team at Best Best and Krieger, worked with the city uh, on this wireless ordinance. So there are certain restrictions placed on the city's authority to regulate these wireless installations in the public right of way, uh, both federal at a federal level and at a state level. Um, so the the standards aren't completely dictated. Uh, the city does have authority to regulate its public right of way and to regulate these installations, but there are certain restrictions, uh, most notably with regard to RF emissions, as that's a, a popular one uh, to bring up. The federal government has uh, taken over uh, this this area. They, they've uh, preempted local governments and state governments and said that um, you're pretty much just limited to uh, verifying compliance with applicable FCC standards. Cities are not permitted to make uh, decisions on these wireless applications uh, based on the environmental effects, including perceived health effects of the wireless facilities, as long as they comply with the FCC standards. So. Um, the, the city can hit that on two fronts. One, as an application requirement, that the applicants show that they comply with FCC standards for RF emissions. And then again, uh, you'll see in the conditions of approval towards the end of the wireless ordinance, one of the conditions relates to compliance with RF emission standards as well. So um, uh, I'm probably, I'm gonna butcher your last name. I'm sorry, Mr. McCurdle. Um, would we be able to set standards as follow as far as like um, visual standards as we would any current cell towers? And would that be anything available similar to what Edison allows now when we're moving to where the cables and the, the, the actual thing, um, uh, the facility must be underground? So you can uh, establish aesthetic standards as part of your, your management of the right of way under state law and then <clears throat> under federal law, um, the FCC has said you can do so as well. The, I believe staff is, is working on uh, design standards. Uh, there are limitations placed on those or requirements for those that were established by the FCC, but you can regulate aesthetics, um, things such as, you know, with you can't require anything that's not technically feasible, but you can, you know, have it in a shroud or, or have it match the, the pole. Uh, with regard to cables and wiring, um, a popular option is to have it either uh, within the pole, if it's a new, you know, replacement pole or under conduit. With regard to undergrounding, um, it's a bit less clear. The FCC's requirements are that it be reasonable, uh, not more burdensome than that placed on similar types of infrastructure, objective and published in advance. So um, basically, I, I think a general concept is whenever you're treating wireless differently, you're, there's more legal risk than if you're treating wireless the same. So for example, if you require undergrounding of all utilities in a certain area, then it may be more justifiable to have an undergrounding requirement. If uh, no utilities but wireless are required to underground in a certain area, then perhaps the, the wireless uh, companies will have more pushback. So it just depends. So, uh, but you are allowed to regulate aesthetics. Uh, no, and, and thank you very much for your examples. Um, that being said, after examples are being pre are, are presented to us, um, like, are we locking ourselves in if, if we don't set any standards now, since we haven't been presented any uh, examples or any type of standards that we would be looking at? So the way the wireless ordinance uh, handles the design standards, 
is to allow um, uh, city staff, I believe it, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I need to pull it up which dire director, but the city staff level to issue, uh, uh, publish the design standards. Um, like I said, the FCC only required that they be published in advance of receiving an application, but they did not uh, say what published means. So the key is just that they're out there on either, you know, some cities will take it as a resolution, some cities will do it, uh, publish it at the staff level on the website. The key really is just to, to be able to maintain flexibility so that you don't fully lock yourself in as technology changes, um, as you work with the industry to see, you know, what's feasible, what's not. Uh, it's easier to, to hone them or adapt them versus if they're just in the ordinance entirely, it's much more difficult to change them. And, and so as, as you mentioned, as uh, technology adapts, um, how how easy and how difficult would you say if um, would, it, would they be able to get removed if the technology would be no longer uh, like I don't I wouldn't want to end up with more like telephone uh, boxes out there, you know? Yeah, just MD gotcha. So uh, that can be handled in a couple ways. So one, as a condition of approval, uh, in terms of you know if if, if a facility is not being used, how you know what recourse does the city have to take it down? I believe there's a condition of approval <clears throat> relating to a performance bond, and if it's going on uh, city a city-owned pole like a city-owned streetlight, then there will also be a, a some sort of agreement like a master license agreement that sets the terms of using a city light pole. So those would be two angles to, to attack that issue. Um, and if the technology changes in the future, let's say they wanna swap out an antenna, um, most likely they would, unless there was something to, different in that agreement that I mentioned, uh, most likely they would just have to come back through the city's, this permitting process that you're gonna be establishing um, with this ordinance. Thank you, those are all my questions. Thank you, Councilmember Preciado. Councilmember Garcia. I mean, Councilmember Preciado took all the wind out of my cells. Thank you for all of your amazing questions, um, Councilmember Preciado, and no que more questions at this time, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Anavarez Cole. Thank you, Mayor. I just have one question. Um, how many locations are, are you? Um, thinking about? Uh, the, go, I'll, I'll try to answer this first and then maybe Andrew can, can chime in, but uh, there, there is no number. Uh, we're not looking for, we don't have, we have not established a minimum number or a maximum number at this point in time. Uh, we, we just, we just don't have that information. I mean, we don't, you know, we've, we've had a couple inquiries probably late last year from some of these cell phone uh, providers uh, regarding the potential of uh, in, installing these kind of small cell facilities. Uh, but we haven't had anything since, and we really have, can't do anything until uh, this ordinance uh, is approved and the resolution is approved. So um, will this be something that would be in a residential area by any chance, or is this going to be something that will be on a corridor in a park? What are we talking about here? Go ahead, go ahead, Andrew. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to jump in. Uh, these can be pretty much anywhere uh, in the city. The small cell facilities, which are the, the wireless facilities growing in popularity within the right of way, um, they're, the positive is that, or the benefit is that they're smaller in, in size and form factor, but the challenge that presents is that they, the limitation is they can't reach as far. So perhaps say a thousand feet, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, and so there need to be more of them. Uh, further, the city or the carriers generally want to go into the areas of the city uh, that are densely populated or that have a lot of traffic uh, and to, to kind of supplement the network there. So there is certainly a chance it would go in residential areas. Um, the design standards and location preferences can set some restrictions on that, but uh, both under federal and state law, different laws, but uh, you cannot so under federal law, you cannot do anything that's going to prohibit or effectively prohibit the provision of wireless services. So meaning um, if you are going to restrict or try to restrict the carriers from a certain area, um, there's not a, you know, a set thing where, oh, it has to be this far from 
each each wireless facility or this far from a certain property. But there are two key considerations. So one is you have to look at the cumulative impact of those to make sure that you're not restricting um, installations in large swaths of the city. And the other consideration um, is just yeah, that you, that you're not being too restrictive, and um, and that you're not basing those concerns uh, or those restrictions off of health concerns. They, they cannot. They have to be based on aesthetics. Um, so those are the two main things to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just just since uh, um, not not you, uh, Councilmember Honoras Cole, but forgive me. Can you re remind me your last name? Attorney? Uh, McArdle, Andrew, Andrew oh, McArdle. McArdle. For, for, forgive me, Mr. McArdle. <laughs> so, so when it comes to the issue of equity, right, which is where these get placed in certain neighborhoods, certain communities, is that a factor in any of this? Like, so for example, I, if you have a preponderance of these in the poorer parts of Pomona, uh, lower income communities within Pomona, as opposed to uh, middle, upper middle income communities, is that how do you treat that? So uh, with small cell facilities, given their lack of reach, that is not uh, as much of a concern. Um, I think yeah, certainly with the larger towers, uh, there could be maybe a chance that they're sited in a certain area knowing that they'll cover other areas. I'm not sure. But with the small cell facilities that this ordinance is going to regulate and restrict, so meaning it's going to limit installations in the right of way to the smaller facilities and not allow these large towers in the right of way, which happen in, in some areas um, that not in other cities and, and locations, uh, they need to be where the demand is because they're only reaching, you know, 500 to maybe 1500 feet. And so they can't park them in potentially, a, you know, an area where it's less expensive for them to do so or, or whatever the case may be, and then have them project out to other areas. It, it, it has to be close to where they need that capacity. That, okay, that, that's helpful to understand. I mean, I'm, sure. Don't want to confuse them with these larger towers where sometimes they have, right. a, there's, there's always the potential that it ends up in certain neighborhoods where, you know, there is that uh, feeling of risk, that, that environmental risk, that health risk, uh, that it um, uh, could have on uh, certain communities. Uh, I, I realize that the, the, w the way the law is written, uh, federal laws, it doesn't, it doesn't allow you to take that into consideration if I understand you correctly. Right. Okay. All right. Um, it's, it's, it's an important lesson uh, that all of us understand of how critical representation is uh, in Washington, D.C., because this is a policy issue, right? This is, this is a decision that gets made at the uh, level of the Congress and the Senate, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, the FCC, so was it this, the, the limitation on local government authority with regard to RF missions was established uh, in the Telecommunications Act of 1996, so oh, <laughs> a ways back. Yeah. Um, they did, the FCC did recently re-examine uh, its emission standards and, and issue an order basically saying that, that they don't see a need to change anything. Sure, understood. Thank you. All right, I'll turn it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You got, you got muted quickly there, but I think you called on me. Um, I'll shoot an arrow also. You can go, you can go Council Member Lester. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I'll, I'll shoot an arrow also at uh, Council Member Preciado because uh, he asked the questions uh, that I was going to ask regarding design. Uh, and I think that those, those, those questions were, were answered a little bit earlier. Um, it's kind of unfortunate that the, uh, the city's ability to, to regulate um, wireless facilities, whether they be the the traditional types of facilities that we're all familiar with or versus the new small cell facilities uh, that have become popular, um, that, that the city's uh, ability uh, to uh, kind of uh, set standards and that sort of thing has been kind of taken away by the federal government through, through federal actions. Um, but that said, uh, I think that uh, technology has changed over the years where I think that um, uh, we, particularly with with regular facilities, I think we're getting some better designs and they're blending a little bit more into the environment irrespective of how we, we may all feel about them. Um, the, uh, the question that I have, and I don't know whether this would be for Renee or for Andrew, um, would, would these um, 
design standards uh, with respect to appearance, that sort of thing. Um, I, I certainly I'm 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 comfortable with with staff uh, crafting those standards, whether it be public works or a combination of public works and development services. Would they also apply to facilities that say our utilities may erect? Uh, I remember several years ago, uh, Southern California Gas Company uh, erected um, facilities, certain, certainly here in my district, and I'm sure probably throughout, throughout Pomona, um, where they, they have their, the meters are all read wirelessly now. And they've had to erect some, um, uh, some poles with what looks like a, uh, almost like a, uh, like a, a reflective panel on it uh, in various, various places throughout the community. And I'm, I guess I'm just curious is that if other utilities, whether it could be our, our water department, it could be Edison, it could be another utility, if they were to erect facilities like that, would they be subject to this ordinance as well? I, I'm gonna take a quick guess and say no. That's my uneducated guess, but I'll, I'll let, uh, that doesn't say if, it, if, if uh, Andrew, uh, concurs with me, that doesn't mean that maybe we can't, um, you know, establish similar type of uh, regulations and design standards, but I'll let Andrew correct me. So you're right, the, the scope of the ordinance uh, is limited to wireless uh, in, in installations, wireless communications facilities in the public right of way, uh, as they're defined uh, in the definition section of the ordinance. So it would not apply to uh, other installations unrelated to the wireless facility, uh, but cities do often, and I, I believe Pomona most likely will have some provision uh, addressing the meters related to the wireless facility, because um, the electric meters can sometimes be an issue. Uh, but um, as far as regulating aesthetics of other utility installations, that would be, that would have to be handled separately and bit outside my purview, but okay. we could no, certainly I, help with that if needed. I, I, I appreciate that. And I just, I brought it up because I just want to, I want to go on record that I think that uh, uh, that technology is advancing to where we, you know, we've seen one utility do it. We may see other utilities do it. And I would just like to, to see that uh, uh, they be held also to some standard um, when, you know, irrespective of what, whether it goes into a residential neighborhood, commercial, industrial, whatever, that it's designed so that it kind of blends in, doesn't stick out like a, like a, like a sore thumb. Uh, we have one installation the gas company did here in District 5 uh, that um, uh, it, it kind of does stick out. Uh, and it doesn't match anything that's, that's around it or anything like that. It almost, it almost looks like it's out of place. Um, so um, just, just want to bring that up. It's just maybe something to think about for, uh, for the future. Thank you. Uh, duly noted. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may, if I can piggyback on an earlier comment by Councilmember Lustro, um, just, you know, in, uh, to piggyback on uh, Councilmember Lustro's comment about pretty much how the federal government has hamstrung us, part of this as well, if and when this ordinance uh, gets established, uh, should a provider submit a application for a permit, uh, the federal government has also hamstrung us by establishing what they call a shot clock like there's a 24 second shot clock in basketball, uh, we would have 60 days to issue that permit. Uh, and if not, if we don't issue it, uh, we violated some, some statute in, in their order. Uh, so uh, just another, another example of uh, being hamstrung by the feds. <laughs> That's it. Uh, Councilman Torres. Um, yes, I just want to reiterate uh, the importance of um, maintaining certain standards here in the city of Pomona because um, oftentimes what we hear from residents or what we may see is, um, you know, just different level of standards in different communities like San Dimas or Claremont. Um, I just want to make sure that the staff is taking into consideration that, you know, residents of Pomona want similar standards when it comes to aesthetics and how these things um, fit into our community. Um, just want the staff to um, hold people accountable. Um, just because it's the city of Pomona, just because it's one of the poor areas in the county, um, doesn't mean, you know, we care about how our community looks, right? Um, so I just want to make sure that staff understands. And secondly, I'm reading the staff report and it says that, um, and this is just, just curious, um, that 
wireless companies have increasingly sought to install these facilities. Um, have we been, has our city been lobbied by or contacted um, by any wireless facilities or wireless companies in regards to this ordinance? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Uh, we, like I, I mentioned earlier, we, we have been contacted uh, by um, one or two of the providers probably late last year uh, who, who showed some interest in, in doing this. Uh, obviously at that time we did not have an ordinance or any kind of uh, you know, fee schedule established. So we wanted to make sure that we, we worked through the process to get this ordinance established and the fees, the proper fees established and made sure that we did it right and correctly. Um, we didn't. We weren't rushed into this. In fact, I, I would like to say we took our time with this to make sure we did it correctly, and we worked with Mr. McArdle to make sure that we've we've done it right and per the FCC FCC orders. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, so before we uh, before I ask for a motion, I'd like to ask um, Rosalie to please read the ordinance title. Okay. Ordinance number 4279, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Pomona, California, adding uh, Division 3 wireless facilities and right away to Chapter 46, streets, sidewalks, and other public places, Article 4, encroachments of the Pomona City Code. And that's the um, first part of the motion. That's 11 1. And um, can we take both of them together? We can do that, yes. Yeah, if we can do that. Go ahead, you wanna read that? Uh, we can go ahead and um, introduce, wait for the reading and give first reading to ordinance number 4279 uh, and also adopt the following resolution, which is resolution number 2020-106. And it's establishing a fee schedule for wireless encroachment permits to install wireless facilities in the public right of way pursuant to city municipal code chapter 46, article 4. Division three wireless facilities and public rights of way. Thank you, Rosalia. So uh, unless there are any other questions, can I have a motion from the city council? I'll move the item as read by the city clerk. Okay, can I get a second? Second, Mayor. Okay, we have a first by Councilmember Lestro, a second by Councilmember Garcia. Rosalia, will you please take the roll, roll call? Absolutely. Councilmember Preciado? No. Garcia? Yes. Ontiveros Coco? Uh, Councilor Ontiveros Coco, you're on mute. No. Lastro? Yes. Councilor Torres? No. And Mayor Sandoval? Uh, I'm a no as well. Um, and I think that um, clearly there are some questions that the council has regarding this uh, that I think we're gonna have to take up uh, certainly at a future meeting. Okay. So the final vote uh, is um, four, four, one, five, one. I have two, uh, uh, two. Sorry, you're right, yeah. Four, four two, okay. All right, uh, if we can go ahead and uh, move on to the next item. Next item is item number 12. It's a finding of public benefit to the community at large, recommended expenditures and recap of funds. Okay, um, unless the council has any questions or wants to comment on any of these, can I get a motion? Move to approve, Mayor. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, do roll call. Council Member Preciado? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Ontiveros Cole? Yes. Mastro? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Council Robert Torres? Yes. Mayor Sandoval? Yes. Moving on to item 13. Item uh, number 13 is an urgency ordinance extending temporary moratorium on a foreclosure and eviction to do not payment of rent and an executive order extending the suspension of water, sh water shutoffs and certain late fees due to the impact of COVID-19. Okay, All right. do we have any um, speakers on this item? We do not. Okay, all right. Um, 
Counselor, I think I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Um, Mayor and council members, um, the staff report before you this evening is a request to consider the adoption of an urgency ordinance and also some related actions to extend some emergency actions that you previously took. Um, when this item was prepared, we simply prepared it as an extension of actions that the council had previously taken under Governor Newsom's executive order number 928-20 and under um, a further order number N3720. So basically on the actions you've taken before protected your te tenants, both residential and commercial from evictions. There were also um, processes to address foreclosures as a result of financial um, um, conditions that were impacting your residents and your tenants um, uh, by COVID-19. Um, we have recently researched and learned that the County of Los Angeles using its powers under the Emergency Services Act of California can issue their own orders on a countywide basis to also include regulation for all incorporated cities. This is not normally the case. Normally counties make rules that apply to their unincorporated territories. Um, and in this case, they've passed rules that can apply in the incorporated areas, provided that a city does not already have its own regulations. Um, uh, the governor extended his executive order to provide these protections um, through September 30th, and the County Board of Supervisors also adopted an extension of their regulations. I had an opportunity to compare the LA County regulations to the City of Pomona regulations. And in every regard, with the exception of the foreclosure, they are nearly identical. However, the county does provide some, some extra protections, some of which I think some of you would ask me before whether we could or should adopt. And I gave you legal advice as to what I thought some of the risks might be. So in essence, although we presented to you this urgency ordinance, if you were to decide not to adopt it this evening, here's what would happen. The county's um, action would protect your residents and your tenants, and it would increase the amount of time that they would have to pay any rents that are due and owing. Your, or, your ordinance says that they must pay within six months of the expiration of the emergency, and their ordinance gives them 12 months. Um, I also was able to determine that this actually protects both residential and commercial tenants, um, but it protects commercial tenants with um, fewer, it's commercial tenants with 10 or more, but fewer than 100 employees shall have six months to repay their landlords. Um, also, in addition to non-payment of rent, their protection, the county protects for late charges, interest, and any other types of fees that are accrued by the tenants. Um, and also extends to no fault eviction um, causes of action. So uh, they both are, they're identical in that they provide for relief from COVID related financial impacts, um, uh, impacts that have impact people's abilities to pay their rent. And they both operate as an affirmative defense. So the item before you is broken up into an urgency ordinance. And then there's some other measures in this item, um, for example, to um, extend protections against utility shutoffs and so on. So if the council were interested, it could move forward with the other protections in this agenda item. But if you decline to adopt the urgency ordinance, you would not only have the same protections, but you would have some additional protections for your tenants. Thank you, Councillor. All right, I'm sure the council may have some questions uh, because this is uh, something new. Uh, that's being introduced um, because if I'm understanding you correctly, if we if we don't, um, if we were to vote down the urgency ordinance, extending the temporary moratorium, in essence, the county's um, order uh, would be uh, what our tenants, uh, how, how, how our tenants would be protected, correct? Okay, correct. I'm gonna go to Council Member Preciado and he may have some questions. Uh, and then we'll move down. Uh, I'm I'm just having difficulty understanding why, like, uh, normally when the state passes something, we we pretty much just match whatever the state does. 
Um, is this because the state and the county also have those same differences you pointed out right now? Or why, in, in this case, do we have the, the choice then of matching the state's extension or the county's extension? And even still denying tonight's ordinance, it just goes to the counties. Why wouldn't it just go to the states? So um, in order to understand that, you're absolutely right, council member, there are different layers of government and different layers of authority, right, and protection. You have the state le level, the county level, and the city level. But in order to understand what is happening here, you have to understand that the governor did not himself impose these um, um, moratoriums on the evictions themselves. Um, he proposed that every county could have the authority to actually adopt their own local regulations to do that. So he gave you the authority. He didn't do it on behalf of the state. He's not a legislator, but he said, here's my executive order. Um, he impacted the timeline and basically said that um, he that, that you, through the court system, that there'd be more time to file and that there wouldn't be anyone actually, actually evicted but he gave this authority to the cities and the counties. What happened is that many cities went out like you did and adopted your emergency orders. What I was able to discover, and um, I will admit I did not know, and that was one thing I learned through this process, is the county can use powers under the Emergency Services Act of California when there's some type of you know, unprecedented problem like we have now with COVID-19. And it's under those powers that it's adopted this order, and that's why it's applying countywide. So um, I've looked at the resolution that the counties adopted, as, as well as the motion that was made by the supervisor, and it looks like it was the county's intent to have more even regulations countywide, so that each city wasn't coming up with their own, or in some cities they were simply getting left behind because local councils did not want to adopt these measures. So that's what the county did. They use this emergency authority. Um, and again, if you don't adopt the moratorium of your own, then this one will apply in your city. If, uh, if the county's uh, applies, would we then just be subject to however long they decide to, to, uh, to keep theirs? Or would we be able to then enact one later on if we so choose to? Um, my, um, in my opinion, just because you would defer to the county's regulations would not preclude you in the future to adopt your own should they decide not to extend. Theirs only extends at this time through September 30th, which is consistent with what the governor um, extended his timeline authorizing you and the county to adopt these types of regulations. Uh, those are my questions. Thank you very much for the clarification. You're, you're welcome. Councilmember Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. I believe I also have a question for our city attorney. Um, which in your legal opinion is the most robust of the moratoriums? Um, I think that the county's moratorium offers um, two advantages and also I think a nice balance that ours does not. One is that extension of six additional months um, for both residential and commercial tenants to pay back due rent. But one of the things that I found really interesting is that the county excludes multinational publicly traded or businesses that have 100 employees or more. So it's not a lot. It's doing that balance of saying, well, just because you're behind in rent, we're not going to let you take advantage of this protection. If, for example, you have other means of paying. Ours is just broad. And so in reviewing them, I think the county has presented a nice alternative. So in other words, the county's um, initiative prevents multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations from going, oops, sorry, we're not paying our rent right now. Correct. It has tried to put in a little bit of a protection in there. And also on the commercial side, their commercial protections apply. Um, let me just go here real quick, make sure I have this correct. Their commercial protections apply um, when there are 10 or fewer um, employees. And so right now, are we, so in reality, there's, there's a benefit for being in line with LA County 
regulations to our residents rather than just the ordinance we came up with? I believe there is based on what I've reviewed. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, Councilman Rondavera's call. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have no questions. Uh, uh, Sonia has answered my questions. Uh, Councilman Alestro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sonia, you mentioned at the beginning of your report that the county, the county ordinance covered everything that the city ordinance did, and that it has the additional six months of, of uh, allowance for payback uh, for past due rent. But did I hear you correctly to say that the, the county ordinance does not address foreclosures? Um, so from what I can see here, and I'm looking at a bunch of notes, so hopefully I haven't missed it, but um, the city's uh, ordinance says that there shall be no foreclosure action against a property right. owner. It can't be initiated or you cannot proceed with it. Um, there have been some state actions and so at the federal level that have provided protections. There have been some directions to the banks and so on. So while the county does not, I believe that some of those protections are, are, are being provided. When we adopted ours, you may recall in March, um, we were trying to include everything we possibly could. So some of the laws have evolved in that area. Okay, thank you. I, I, um, that's, that, that's all I have for now. I, I'm kind of uh, leaning, leaning toward the, uh, uh, the, the, county's, the county's ordinance because I think it uh, provides some additional protections. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Torres. Um, no comment, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Councilor, for the explanation. I uh, just wanna share with the uh, council uh, how this developed. Um, I think all of us were certainly going into this with the idea of extending uh, the temporary moratorium uh, on foreclosures and evictions. And I, I received a call from uh, Yesenia uh, Miranda Mesa, who is a part of PUSH, and uh, she shared with me um, some of the uh, steps that other cities are taking and shared with me what the county is doing or what the county has done. And um, I, I reached out to Sonia to ask about this. And I think it was a, uh, an important conversation to have because uh, I don't think any of this would have been uh, came forward uh, today. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Yusenia for that work and, and also Sonia for uh, doing uh, the extra investigation because I know you just you spoke to several uh, folks about trying to understand the county measure and the bottom line is that the county measure uh, is a measure that is provides greater protection to our tenants uh, and renters. And obviously, it's a very significant issue for folks right now uh, in the concern that uh, they, have, uh, they have about being able to survive uh, this difficult time. And I, and I genuinely believe that ultimately there's going to have to be a stimulus that helps not just our renters, but obviously by helping our renters, we're helping our landlords, uh, particularly our small landlords who uh, may be struggling uh, during this time, so uh, so how I how I see the LA County um, order is that it is to the benefit of our residents uh, and specifically to our renters, and that by not passing tonight the urgency ordinance extending the temporary moratorium on foreclosures and evictions, that we will be covered by the county. Uh, but I do have a question, Councilor uh, Sonia, that. Um, I, I wanna make sure that we don't uh, leave out the suspension of water shutoffs and certain late fees due to the impact of COVID-19. So how, how might we sort of maybe amend the ordinance? Can we do that? Well, I think your staff, I have to give credit to your staff. They did a very good job up front of breaking out the um, urgency ordinance from just a minute action. So in the staff report, um, if you took recommended action number two, you would be approving the related emergency directives without uh, impacting the ordinance. So 
Um, I guess the revised recommendation based on what we've discussed is to adopt um, recommendation number two, approve the following related to emergency directives, extend um, suspension of shutoff of water service for residents and businesses, extend the emergency directive to su suspend late payment penalties or fees for those um, enterprise operations, and do not extend the suspension of parking citations or the late payment on certain citations issued for parking violations. Okay, so thank you for, for, uh, for pointing that out. Rather obvious fact yes. right there. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments from the council? Mayor, I had just a quick comment on my part. Um, yes. I do want to um, ask staff that we continue to um, advertise through social media and whatever means we have to residents that they are not currently being charged late fees. I know that this is uh, an issue and a problem with our residents, that they're very concerned that they're going to have, um, uh, they're going to accumulate too much to pay back. So I would really um, ask our staff to please make that well known throughout our community so people's level of stress can go down just a tiny little bit. We will continue to message that to the community, Council Member Garcia. Thank you. I appreciate it, City Manager. Okay. Um, Rosalia, do you, do you wanna go ahead and read the, um, the ordinance? Uh, or, or would you like for me to make the motion first so you know which one we're, we're, we're I'm, I'm uh, proposing we approve? Okay, so my understanding is that we're, we were, we're not moving forward with the urgency ordinance and we're going to be moving forward with recommendation number two of the staff report as the city attorney has read before. Correct. That's, okay. that, that, would be, that would be my motion. Okay. So in fact, I will motion that. Do you okay. need to read that? No. Okay. Alrighty. Can okay. I get a second to my motion? Uh, I'm sorry, who is that? Councilmember Lushko? Okay, can we do a roll call, Count, uh, Rosalia? Councilmember Preciado? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Consideros Cole? Yes. Castro? Yes. Torres? Yes. Mayor Sandoval? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, we move on to the next item. Next item is item number 14, the Retirement Incentive Program Adoption. Okay, uh, do we have any speakers on that item? Here. We don't? We do not. Do we have any speakers on any of the other items? Uh, yes, we do. We have one okay. speaker, two speakers for item number 15. Okay, great. All right. Okay, and uh, do we have a staff presentation? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Linda Matthews, Human Resources and Risk Management Director. I have no specific presentation. This is on discussion as a best practice to make sure that uh, benefit-related decisions are not just passed on consent. Uh, this item was before you uh, last meeting to disclose the cost. This basically provides a retirement incentive to all employees who are eligible to apply for retirement through CalPERS, and the retirement incentive would be uh, fifteen thousand dollars for the non-sworn or professional staff, and twenty thousand for the sworn staff. I'm available for any questions. Thank you, thank you. I'm sure the council may have questions. Uh, Councilmember Torres, we'll go ahead and start with you, and then we'll move our way down. Yeah, just a question from the city staff in terms of what was the feedback from employees regarding this uh, proposal. Um, we did meet with uh, each of the unions on um, several occasions, and some of it was more informal over the phone conversations. Um, I believe on the um, non-sworn side with the Teamsters and uh, PMMCEA, they're, they um, think this could be a good proposal. I don't have an, an idea of how many will take it. Um, from the sworn side, they do believe that the 20000 is not sufficient. They made a request to uh, increase it to 30000 um, which I think was reviewed. We're not recommending the increase, and we are recommending the twenty thousand. When you said uh, we recommend, is the staff that um, takes that information and then makes? You're saying the staff came up with the recommendation not to go with thirty thousand? No, the council. It was uh, um, at some point we uh, discussed it in closed session. That was direction of the council. Okay, and then. Um, 
Um, you know, another question I had was, um, you know, I'll come back. I have to, I have to come back later for this. Thank you. Uh, Council member Lestro. Um, no questions, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, that the, the information that was provided by, uh, provided by staff regarding the retirement incentive in the previous meeting was, uh, uh, was sufficient. Thank you. A council member on a verse call. No questions. A council member Garcia. No questions, Mayor. I really appreciate a city staff working, or I should say uh, Ms. Matthews working for this, what is called in the teaching world, a golden handshake. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, council member Preciado. Uh, no questions, thank you. And Councilmember Torres, do you um, want to speak on this matter? I know you said you needed to give it some more thought. Yeah, I just want to encourage um, the staff and the, and the workers to contact me um, and um, to give me their thoughts on, on what they feel about this. Last thing I want to do is make a decision um, you know, without, without their input. Um, I've been contacted by several employees who've been concerned by some of the comments by some of the council members in the newspaper. Um, and I just want to encourage employees that um, I want to reassure the city employees that, um, you know, we as a city support them and that this uh, proposal here um, that I hope um, is not a slap in the face to them, um, but instead is a, uh, um, you know, a, a, a step in the right direction in terms of the cities trying to work with them and find a, um, a solution. Now, if, if the negotiations are not going um, as the staff says they're going or, or if something, something's incorrect, I, I hope that the workers would let me know. Um, that's all I have to have. Thank, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the council? Okay. I will uh, need a motion uh, from the council. Move to approve, Mayor. Okay, I second. have a first and I've got a second. Already council member, uh, roll call, Rosalia. Roll call, uh, council member Preciado. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Ciberos Cole. Yes. Castro. Yes. Torres. Yes. Mayor Sandoval. Yes. Alrighty, we'll move on to uh, the next item. Next item is discussion item number 15. It's a discussion on approval process for temporary art and other innovative art citywide. And we do have two speakers this evening. Okay, uh, and do we have a uh, staff presentation? We do, Mayor. Okay, okay. thank you, Anita. Thank you. And John, I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, uh, so good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, today I'm bringing forward a discussion on temporary art and other innovative art projects uh, citywide. Oops. There we go. Um, there's two current processes for approval of art in the city of Pomona. One is the Arts and Public Places Program and its associated funding. The second is original artwork murals that are approved through free mural permits. Also, both of these projects uh, uh, processes go through the Citizens Advisory uh, Committee, Cultural Arts Citizens Advisory Committee, as well as the Cultural Arts Commission. Uh, public art, uh, art funded through the Arts and Public Places is permanent. Um, art through the mural permit is required to be up for a duration of at least five years. Uh, what we've seen over the past year or so is definitely a steady and persistent community demand to allow for different types of art that isn't specifically outlined in the two processes that I just mentioned. Um, uh, we've seen a lot of interest in doing a variety of art. I think there's a sense of uh, from the community that art creates place and helps um, uh, beautify their community. And so definitely um, an interest in the community in trying to expand <coughs> the types of art that we allow. Bless you. Uh, one of the ways that we would try to accommodate this is uh, one, we've tried to utilize the existing mural permit that we have in place. 
But again, there's some limitations with that because again, that contemplates a mural being in place for five years. Another way that we've tried to accommodate this uh, need from the community, uh, this desire is through a pilot program uh, through the Activate Pomona permit. Um, uh, here's an outline of five step uh, process that we've created to do uh, over the counter approval of pop-up art as, uh, as is allowed under Activate Pomona. So the way that we've created that to work is a, an applicant submits an art project, staff reviews it as long as it doesn't contain um, profanity um, or, or violent uh, images, um, we would recommend approval. Um, we email, a, uh, email that image and scope of work to the cultural arts commissioners. Uh, they have 48 hours to then uh, call that item up for review to say that they have some concerns with that artwork and they wanna review the content. And then we would schedule it for the next uh, cultural arts commission uh, meeting. Uh, if there's no objections, we approve it. Uh, this is uh, two examples of recent temporary art. So the one on the left here on the, with the cat is um, the one that was approved through the recent Activate Pomona permit through that system I just outlined. That whole process to be able to approve took about uh, a week, uh, a little less than a week uh, to get it, uh, get it approved by the commission. I'm sure they had their insurance uh, for staff to review it and issue the permit. The one on the right is a mural that um, was approved a few months back that we had to take through this modified process of a mural permit. Uh, this was in one of our parks. Um, it had to go through both the um, Arts, Parks and Rec Commission as well as the Cultural Arts Commission. So it took, uh, again, over a month to get approved because it had to go to both commissions, get approval for location, and then come to Cultural Arts as a matter of um, a commission, an agenda item to get their weigh in and feedback. Um, here's some ex different examples of other temporary art that we've received interest in. So this would be uh, a wraps for some existing uh, utility, uh, utility structures. This is shown in the right of way. There's also uh, utility boxes that are in parks that we've gotten inquiries on. Uh, here's another idea of some other temporary art. This was a, is moving murals. So it's a, a board or a wall that's established somewhere in the city and there's a murals that are painted on it, uh, temporary, again, temporary, and then there, it could be interchanging and you move it throughout the city. So these are some of those innovative art ideas that aren't contemplated in the AIPP funding or in the mural permit. And so we're looking for some feedback from council on um, what council's thoughts on that are. Uh, we've laid out six key questions that we thought uh, might be helpful for council to weigh in on. Um, over the counter permit, uh, over the counter art permit, review of content, maintenance, liability, accessibility, and place based sensitivity or place. Um, there's three of these that I'd like to focus on this evening uh, for council to weigh in on. Uh, the first of those, again, is the over the counter permit. Is this something that the council wants? <clears throat> uh, uh, for it to be an over-the-counter ministerial review? Or is there a threshold where council believes some of this artwork should go to Cultural Arts Commission as an actual public hearing? Um, so we're looking uh, to hear from council on that. Um, secondly, on content review. Uh, who, who does council believe that, that has the purview for reviewing uh, and approving content? Is it um, what we've struggled with in this uh, trying to make a, a way with our current mural process is um, Parks and Rec has been approving location and then Cultural Out has been approving content, but it hasn't been clearly defined. And I think, uh, frankly, staff and, and commissions have struggled on who has that role, um, who reviews the content. And so we're looking for, again, uh, council's uh, opinion here. And if it is going to be a ministerial over the counter, um, is it staff reviewing it? And then, as I mentioned in that pilot program, um, maybe a mechanism is then it's uh, we offer it to the council to be uh, cultural arts commission to be called up. Or if staff can't, feels they can't make a decision on it, we automatically place it on the agenda for uh, a public hearing at cultural arts. Uh, third issue is a, a place-based uh, sensitivity or place. Um, so uh, due to different locations and where people gather in parks, um, again, I, this, this relates to what commission do, does the council believe should be reviewing this? So in particular, I think as outlined in, in the staff report presented, there are some nuances in particular with our parks. I think there's a lot more ownership of community over parks. 
Um, and so we want to ensure that the appropriate body um, is reviewing it for um, any sensitivities that may be associated with um, a particular place that a community has, you know, um, a, a feelings for. So um, what that might look like is if, um, is if do all of these items need to go to Parks and Rec? I know Parks and Rec is considering doing um, a, a survey of all of the locations um, by which they would allow art. So if that's the case and they've already identified the location, are you okay with it not going to Parks and Rec for content as long as they've already identified the area and it just goes to cultural arts um, if need be or review by staff? So those are some of the questions there. Um, staff's recommendation is uh, there's two options. Uh, the first is, which is what staff is recommending, is establishing a ministerial over-the-counter permit process, something along the lines of what I outlined in that pilot program. And the reason for that is, again, because we've heard the need, uh, the request from the community to allow for different types of art, again, temporary, um, and again, what that may mean to one may mean something from another. Uh, we were thinking of something along the lines of six months to a year is temporary um, and to allow for some of that art to come in um, uh, on a consistent basis and not kind of be bogged down in a, in a heavy process. Uh, so that's staff's recommendation. And then I'll come back to these uh, guiding questions for, for uh, council to comment on. Uh, and, and that concludes my presentation and, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Anita. Um... Rosalie, do we have any speakers on this item? I think you said we had Yes, we couple. do. We have a few speakers, yes. Okay. You want to go ahead and read those? Sure. First uh, comment is from Ricardo Estillo, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. While there is a vast range of lovely public art on display in the city, it is important not to only to establish rules, but also to ensure that everyone knows them. It will take a full commitment from every stakeholder because art is subjective and it is difficult to predict how people would feel about each individual project. Thus, it is imperative that we take the time to understand and be inclusive to as many groups as possible. I believe an over-the-counter approach would not allocate the time required to consider all the intri intricacies, the myriad of sensibilities the city encompasses. Um, an, art, an artist could submit a proposal, get rejected, move heaven and earth to accommodate the criticisms only to have the critic reveal themselves as agnostic. Then the process starts over or the artist gives up. On the other hand, even after a full review, what assurance are we given that uh, what has been substituted is what ends up being installed? Um, as an ardent supporter of the arts, I'm hopeful that public art projects uh, that meet approval ultimately do not disappoint. Next comment is from Margaret Achiel. The DAW Center for the Arts is in support of a user-friendly process for public art projects. The DAW has been and remains an invested advocate for many years for this type of positive activity. The arts invite public dialogue, add to a community's creative learning, provide a safe and powerful tool to engage residents of all ages, and ultimately build a healthier culture. The DAW would like to be considered as a partner to bring awareness to this program and to help residents of all ages with this process once it is decided. Thanks to the gift from the California Community Foundations and the Getty, the DAW has provided over 250 Zoom studios from drawing, painting, music, dance, and creative writing to home district in Pomona during COVID. We prioritize the children and families with the funds. They had never heard of the DAW and it is very clear they all want more art in every form. Based on our conversations with the far-reaching households of Pomona, I know the residents would be in favor of this improvement. And that was the final comment, Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Rosalia. All right. Um, Councilor Preciado, would you like to weigh in? Uh, yeah. You know, first I'd like to start off by thanking staff um, I know earlier in the year, uh, we had asked to start setting up uh, a standard and, uh, and, and, and rules and regulations for uh, temporary art. And I think that's the first part that I'd like to start off is making sure people are clear that this is for temporary art. Um, I'd like your suggestion, Anita, uh, Director Gutierrez, about keeping it um, to six months to a year or, or less as, as defined by the applicant, what the applicant chooses to do. Um, as long as it, it stays in the temporary um, time frame, um, And maybe I can ask, ask this question, would you like for us to go over all six items individually or just, just say yes or no? What would you prefer? And sure, if Mayor, you have an opinion. Mayor, you wanna, maybe you wanna jump in and say something. 
I mean, from our perspective, yes, if you have a comment on a, those six, that would be great. I think the, the three key ones are here, but if you have comments on all six, that would be fantastic. We're looking for any feedback that you have. I, I, I did give you, um, I, we were talking about this earlier, so I'll just try to go through it as fast as I can, and, and maybe you can uh, help me align with what we, uh, we went over earlier today. Um, I think on the first one, on over-the-counter art permit, uh, first of all, like, what is the threshold? I think it, the, the, the permanent murals still need to, we're not touching that, that process. And so the only over-the-counter permits that would yeah, get looked at on the over-the-counter review, I, I believe, should be the temporary art application. And I like what you suggested on the pilot program that's been uh, going on with Activate Pomona, where it would be a hybrid, um, where the Cultural Arts Commission would still get notified. And I want to include that any... Um, any overlaying commission. So if, if, if it happens to be on a, 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 on a, a, on a location-based purview of, of another commission, for example, at a park, uh, that, that maybe they get an email as well. But I do wanna make clear that I believe that the, that, that would be for, um, for location and uh, the content would still be viewed at the Cultural Arts Commission, where even any other commissioner would be able to go and speak at the Cultural Arts Commission towards content um, as, as, a, as a resident. Um, are, 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 we, are we on the same page? I am. Uh, just one question. Are you understanding is, what I'm saying? I did, yeah, if, but if, would you want the Parks and Rec Commission to be able to call the item up as we're uh, doing with the cult, Cultural Arts Commission? Or more just an FYI? More just of an FYI. Okay. Uh, I believe that, uh, like the, the parks, you said that they're doing a study, so mm -hmm. All locations are what should should already be identified at that point okay. by the applicant. And if there's a new location that is not yet identified, then I think it should go to the uh, applying uh, body of voting body. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, content review. Uh, like I said, Cultural Arts Commission with a 48-hour appeal process sounds fine with me. Um, number three, the maintenance. I believe maintenance needs to, needs to be uh, maintained by the applicant, and there should be some type of agreement that if it is not maintained, it gets removed, and if it's vandalized, maybe they have uh, an opportunity to fix it, or it can get removed. Um, as far as liability, we were speaking earlier about uh, maybe getting further, further uh, information, but as long as if it's on a as as you did with the uh, activate Pomona and, and uh, the one that was done in the BPD lot, it was work was going to take place during a, a sidewalk, so that we did have them submit a uh, an, an insurance, and as long and if it's taking place in a, a public right of way, then insurance makes sense to me. Uh, I'm sure there might be certain locations based on uh, our risk management and maybe where it's just not needed, where they just can go ahead and paint. There is no danger to the surrounding area or the uh, or, or, or the where it's getting painted. Mm -hmm. um, five, as far as accessibility and how, and just so people can read, uh, if, since if they might not have caught it, and uh, I see that's not on the screen. It says accessibility. How can the city ensure that any and new permitting pathway is accessible, equitable, and easy to complete, so as to not discourage new committee-driven art initiatives? And uh, I believe. Uh, Margaret from the DAW was also speaking towards this. Um, I believe that the, the less red tape, the better, and that would be able to help encourage uh, equitable uh, art throughout the entire city. Um, and then for uh, number six, place-based sensitivity or place uh, for, um, you know, if it's a temporary, uh, again, if it's a temporary permit, then the Cultural Arts Commission and any applicable body would have the opportunity to, um, to to bring it up to their commission if they so believe it needs to be. Thank you. Is that is that it, Councilmember Purcell? Uh, yeah. No further questions. And again, thank you very much for this work. Okay. And and I just uh, and thank you. You, you. you. It was very exhaustive and very valuable. So I just want to say that a lot of what you said, I I absolutely agree with. Uh, for the other council members. If um, there's anything that, you, rather than going through all six, um, if you need to go through all six, go ahead and do so. But if you are, um, if you don't want to weigh in on any of the six, you don't have to. I, 
I think Councilmember Preciado captured a lot of perhaps what a lot of us feel. So, uh, Councilmember Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm so excited to see this coming up before Council. Um, if Anita and Director, um, if Director Gutierrez and Director Diggs remembers, two years ago I came to them asking what we could do to beautify some of the water properties around Pomona. And I, in my um, ignorance of art, suggested some movable walls made out of pallets. And so I'm very excited to see that we're actually moving something forward after those conversations a couple of years ago. Uh, I'll go through the six because I do have um, opinions on this, but over-the-counter permits are our best, uh, just to make it as easy as possible. Content review is very important to me just because I don't want um, there to be anything that could be um, detrimental to a, a community. There's a lot, uh, there was one incident in District 3 where a mini mart put up a mural with questionable substances being consumed by, I, I want to assume they were like weird cats. So just really understanding what the content, uh, asking for a rendering of that art, I feel is necessary. Absolutely agree that maintenance should be a part, it should be the responsibility of the person who applies. As for liability, I honestly believe it depends on location. One of the biggest gripes I have um, with City Hall, even as a council member, is how insurance is, the need for insurance is thrown out there to kind of scare people because there's no idea of, how to get insurance, how costly it is, a process to get it. Uh, when I did the mural at Philadelphia Park, I did not have insurance, but I was on in a safe location. I only use a step stool. So if I'm going to be painting something in a relatively safe location, I don't believe I should need insurance. But if I'm going to do something like create an underpass mural to make our free, our our underpasses uh, more beautiful as we enter our city, then yes, you definitely need liability insurance. I agree for accessibility, the less red tape, the better. And as far as place sensibility is concerned, I would really like a list of pre-approved locations where maybe bigger pieces can go with the recognition there are some, um, some things like utility boxes that should just be assumed. If there is an ugly utility box in your neighborhood, you absolutely have the right to take out a permit, submit a design, and go ahead and take care of that, um, that situation. Other than that, thank you so much for staff to staff and our Cultural Arts Commission for working on this. It's a long time coming, and it's only going to make Pomona more beautiful. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. All righty. Council Moranovero is cool. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I um, really like this. I, I think this is something that we should have been, well, it's time, it's here, and I'm really enjoying this. Um, this, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very tired. Uh, I like it, I approve this. Um, I, I think we need to go forward on it. And I, I agree that the uh, CAC should have the oversight. Of course, uh, if uh, there is any type of suggestions or anything like that from the park and rec, uh, you know, feel free to, um, you know, uh, say uh, something to us and, you know, the, um, the, the Cultural Art Commission will take that under advisement. As far as maintenance, if it gets pretty, you know, if, if there is a problem with, um, with any graffiti, I would assume that, that it would probably have to be removed the whole entire mural, but hopefully people will appreciate the art this is something that's going to beautify our, our areas. And, um, you know, I'm for this. Thank you very much. Party, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Lestro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Preciado pretty much covered everything that I was going to say. Um, the, I'm supportive of the over-the-counter art permits uh, to kind of, you know, cut down on the red tape as we were, we were discussing earlier. Uh, I have no problem with the CAC uh, being the... Uh, being able to call up uh, particular uh, uh, particular proposals, if the if the Parks and Recreation Commission pre-approves locations um, in in our city parks, uh, then I think that uh, any any 
mural that is proposed for any of those approved locations should just be able to move forward. Uh, if there's a, a different location in a park that is proposed that I think that Parks and Rec should have the ability to, to uh, call it up just for, uh, for review. Um, uh, again, content review, uh, the only thing I would be concerned about in, in the, the, the two examples that um, uh, Anita that you showed earlier as far as temporary art, things like that are, I, I don't think are gonna generate a whole lot of controversy or complaints. And I, and I think that uh, artwork like that would be welcome uh, throughout the city. So I think we wanna try to uh, avoid things that might, might kind of work up the community. Um, maintenance, uh, I believe, should be the responsibility of the, the artist or the artists. Um, with respect to liability, if it's on public property, uh, even though there are, are issues sometimes with um, uh, obtaining insurance, I think that it's just it's a necessary evil for the city to potentially uh, be subject to a lawsuit. If unfortunately, if somebody does get hurt on public property, uh, uh, we you know we always talk about trying to minimize risk and that sort of thing. So I'm I'm a, I'm a very strong supporter of. Uh, uh, anybody working on public property to obtain uh, insurance uh, uh, to the city's satisfaction and name the city as additional insured. Um, I agree with the comments about accessibility. I think we have to make the, the process as simple as possible. Um, and then uh, I talked a little bit about uh, uh, murals in parks um, al already. Um, the only comment that I have, and, and uh, Councilmember Garcia brought up the um, uh, doing artwork on the uh, traffic signal cabinets and other similar utility cabinets. Um, I, I have no problem with that. I think it's I think it's a great idea. I think several of us have discussed those and seen those in other cities in the past. But I, I guess my question would be, and maybe this is to Anita, if we we move forward on something like that later on, wouldn't that be of a more permanent nature rather than a temporary nature? Well, actually, it's a great question, Council Member Lestro. So actually, uh, uh, Director Guerrero and I have discussed that. Uh, and uh, one of the examples he's brought forth is what uh, they do in Pomona is instead of paint, which can be uh, difficult to maintain, um, take off, remove, and it kind of becomes permanent, um, is do wraps. Uh, uh huh. And so in particular, that's an idea we thought of that might be a really great uh, youth-led project to get a lot of youth to per, uh, do um, art projects for that and then get them all funded and get them all, uh, all the wraps funded and, and wrap a lot of our utilities. It's something they cur currently do in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I've, seen that, I've seen that occur in a couple of other communities and wow. ever since the first time I saw it, I thought, I thought that's a project we need to pursue in Pomona. So I'm, I'm absolutely supportive of that, of that, that type of project. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Torres? No comment. I'm just glad this is uh, coming uh, to the city council for approval. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to repeat everything that everybody said uh, by not saying it. Uh, <laughs> so just, you know, thank you everyone for your comments. Um, I, um, I, I like simple. Uh, we need to flood the city with art. Um, and it's certainly an opportunity to beautify the city. It's an opportunity to stir conversation. Uh, it's an opportunity to highlight different neighborhoods. Uh, it's, uh, I, I just think it has a way to, has a way of bringing people together. And uh, so the Activate Pomona process that you laid out there, Anita, I'm full support of. I won't go over all the six. I think that you have some good, uh, recommendations, suggestions to work with. Uh, so in terms of the motion, uh, could I get a council member uh, to make a motion um, for this item? I'd like to move the item, please. Okay. And uh, do you need some direction, Anita, on what, when we say move the item, what specifically? Uh, no, I yeah, thank you, Mayor. I think it was very clear. I think it's r really uh, recommendation number one, which is direct staff to create a ministerial over-the-counter review process in line with all the comments that you've said this evening. Yeah. Okay, good, good. All right, all right. And the second was made by Councilmember Garcia. 
Okay, so motion made by Councilman Preciado, second by Councilman Garcia. Uh, Rosalia, will you do the roll call? Sure. Councilman Preciado? Yes. Garcia? An enthusiastic yes. Altiveros Cole? Yes. Castro? Yes. Torres? Yes. And Mayor Sandoval? Yes. Let's move on to the next item. Thank the next you. item is. Uh, item number 16, it's to designate a voting delegate and alternate for the 2020 League of California Cities Annual Conference. And this is actually one of my items. Uh, just really quickly, uh, the League of California Cities Annual Conference is scheduled for October 7th to the 9th, 2020. The annual business meeting is scheduled for Friday, October 9th, 2020. At this meeting, the League membership considers and takes action on resolutions that establish League policies. And uh, an appointment of a voting delegate and alternate must be made each year in order to take part in the voting of the annual business meeting. In addition to a voting delegate, the city council may also appoint up to two alternate voting delegates, one of whom may vote in the event that the designated delegate is unable to serve in that capacity. Okay. Uh, any comments from the council? I, I certainly have a recommendation, um, unless the council has a uh, strong opinion one way or the other. Party, I recommend that the mayor be the voting delegate and that the vice mayor be the alternate. I appreciate being voluntold. Yes, I support that mayor. Yeah, and 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 I think you, Rosalie, you had asked for a second. Um, yes. Uh, is there anybody on the council that would like to be an alternate? And I would imagine that the way it's going to, in terms of how it might have looked in the past, where you actually attend uh, a given location this is probably going to be done virtually yes currently currently right now it's, it's stating that's going to be i believe in yeah long. it's it, it's but yeah it's going to be most likely yeah. yes it'll be done this way <laughs> right mayor okay. since he yes. just finished his term may i suggest that council member perciato former vice mayor be our second alternate if he is available if he's uh if he's up for it sure yeah, I'll, I'll accept. I believe I uh, was at the last voting uh, meeting. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, so so the motion is to have the mayor uh, serve as the delegate and to have the current vice mayor and the past vice mayor, the most recent past vice mayor, uh, to be voting alternates. And that is my motion. And I get a second. Second. All righty. Can we do a roll call? Roll call, Council Preciado? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Cole? Yeah. Astro? Yes. Torres? Yes. Mayor Sandoval? Yes. Item 17. Item number 17 is City Council reappointments to local and regional boards, commissions, agencies for District 1 Council representation. And this is also one of my items. Uh, real quickly, due to the action taken by the City Council on May 23rd, 2020, regarding a resolution of censor pertaining to Councilmember Gonzalez, the City Council will need to reappoint members of the Council to represent District 1 to the external boards, commissions, agencies that the City Council are members of. Okay. Can we can we go through each of these? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, just, just because uh, I know, for example, on the Sanitation District, I'm currently the um, designee. And I want to um, uh, give up that position to Councilmember Lestro, who is my alternate. Uh, okay, because Mayor, I thought that? you become um, the alternate the, the delegate. I'm sorry. It's automatic. The it's it's a mayor mayor by default automatic um, for the county sanitation district. Okay, so yeah. uh, if so so. Can I step off that board? I, I believe you could. I mean, if you, yeah, if you well, want. What, what, what I'm saying is I'd like to just switch. I, I, guess, I guess probably the easiest path, right, is that Council Member Lestral just starts attending those meetings okay. as my alternate. Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, we can do that. Okay, so I just want to make sure, I just want to make sure he gets uh, compensated appropriately for his time. Okay, so did you want to go through each item or did you just want to go through the ones that, um, yeah, just, just the one with Council Member Gonzalez. The only reason I raised that one, because I was going to bring it up with you, um, 
uh, privately, uh, but I do I do want to just uh, let um, you know that uh, Councilmember Lestro will be um, attending those meetings. So yeah, let's go to the specific the ones that are specific to Councilmember Gonzalez. Okay. Uh, so on your roster uh, that was attached to your staff report uh, on page two, the first item would be um, Pomona Valley Protective Association, where we have uh, you, uh, Mayor, and also Councilmember Gonzalez and Councilmember Preciado. So we can need uh, yep. someone else in that position. Okay. Um, could I recommend Councilmember Lestro? Councilmember, would you be open to it? I'm 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 looking I'm looking at the date of the meetings and I I think I can make most of them. Okay. Okay. Already. Um, do, can can we do we have to take each of these separately, Rosalia, uh, in terms of how we vote? If you would like, Mayor, we could do all of them and then take one big vote at the end. Okay, that'll be good. Okay. Already. Uh, next uh, would be Pomona Walnut Roland Joint Water Line Commission, and we have uh, Councilmember Gonzalez as the delegate, and Councilmember Preciado as the voting alternate. Mayor, if I can, uh, if I can suggest, uh, there's I believe there's like two times where I'm uh, I'm the alternate for uh, Councilmember Gonzalez. I don't mind. I've been taking actually the role lately. So I don't mind being moved up and then finding an alternate so that they can also start getting used to these meetings. Yeah, that, that was that was going to be my, my recommendation, uh, Councilmember Preciado. Um, I think it's more of a question of um, on those two boards. One of them is the Pomona Walnut Roland Joint Water Line Commission, and the other is you recall uh, what are the water board? Uh, Executive board. Yes. Okay, so so yeah, I think that's a wise idea. It, is there anyone who wants to serve as the alternate on those boards? <laughs> I notice everybody on the council is kind of looking away. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mayor. Um, I'm trying to consider which ones I can make um, considering when school lets out and staff meetings. I know that the school year is gonna look very different, but I don't want to shirk my duties as the teacher. Um, if you'll just um, give us a moment, um, I'm sure we'll step up. I, I would like to bring up, however, that I would like to step into council member Gonzalez's shoes for the Tri-City Mental Health um, Board, if that would be all right with council, I've already looked at that and I'm comfortable with that time frame. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, any so Rosalia, what if we don't have an alternate? Uh, you know what? Um, what what is? Uh, well, we well, should have an alternate. And, and by the way, the alternate rarely has to attend uh, these meetings. Correct. Right. Okay. Delegate. So, so let's go back to the Pomona Walnut Roland Joint Water Line Commission. I need an alternate, and the, ver the likelihood that you'll have to attend uh, is highly unlikely. There's only three meetings in the year, so. <laughs> and at this point, if you were to attend, probably be through Zoom or some other type of online. You know, I'll, 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 tell, you, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll just put my name down as an alternate. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. And what's the next should, one? Should next we also, um, sorry, Tim, I, I'm just noticing right now. Should, can we also get the, the city staff member updated? Uh, we have a new water director. Absolutely, thank you. We also have a new city manager. Correct. All right, the next one. Next one is BIA, the Building Industry Association, Baldy View Chapter on page three do you do you recall if they've met um i don't think they have in a while if anybody else knows different please chime in yeah I, yeah i don't um, i don't know that they've met um in recent memory can, can can you find out about that one so that way i can as it says here it says meets on an as 
on an as needed basis. So whenever there's someone's needed. Okay. So it's not uh, a regular schedule meeting. Sure, sure. Would anyone want to step into that role? I was going to nominate uh, Councilmember Lustro with his planning experience. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> How can I not accept? <laughs> well, I'm, that, that's fine. I'm willing to take that one. <laughs> All right. Okay. And then the next one, Rosalia? Next one is the Blue Ribbon Committee of the Los Angeles County Fair Association. And actually, he's uh, obviously representing for District 1. Yeah. I mean, Robert, I don't remember when was the last time we met. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think we, I mean, it's been a long time, so. They don't want to meet. Yeah. So, so in terms of the, um, do, do we don't have to have a third person? No. Yeah. So let's just, just, just take him out. Yeah. Okay. All okay. right. Next one. We already decided that was Badra Basin and we have um, council member Preciado in that position. Uh, we just need an alternate. I'll be, I'll be happy to take that alternate position. Rosalia. Thank you. Council member Garcia. Okay. Next item is on page four, and that's the Downtown Pomona Owners Association and the DPOA. And we have uh, Council member Gonzalez as the first alternate. So I, I would recommend we move up Liz as the first alternate, and then just, okay. uh, if you put me down as the second alternate. That's fine, Mayor. And on page five, we have the Southern California Association of, of Governments or SCAG, and we have Councilman Gonzalez as alternate. Yeah, you know, you know, I I understand the SCAG position differently. I don't believe there's an alternate for SCAG, to okay. my knowledge, because there was a meeting that I was going to miss, and I asked. I said, "Can I send my alternate?" And they said, "We don't have alternates." So, I think we may just. Um, eliminate that alternate position altogether. All right, perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see, we did Tri-City. And on page six, we have three more. The City Council Public Works Ad Hoc Committee. We currently have Council Member Gonzalez, Lestro, and Garcia on there. I'll go ahead and take that, Mayor. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What time does it start? It's to be it determined. Be determined. Right. I'm sorry? What is time? as needed Liz, to be determined? Liz, the last time they met was in 1992, so uh, <laughs> no worries, okay? I was eight. It was a very short meeting. I got milk and cookies. It was great. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, the, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rosalie, the next one. I didn't know this was gonna be so much fun. <laughs> next, uh, uh, next uh, group is Vehicle Parking District Ad Hoc Committee. I could say that group actually meets. Uh, so, uh, although of late we haven't met as often, but but the group does meet. Um, I, I, I guess it's more of a question of, you know, do we? Do we I, I guess. I guess. Anyways, all right. Does anybody want to step up and take on the additional role of being on the? Vehicle Parking District Ad Hoc Committee. I can tell you they do feed you. <laughs> and uh, the meeting started at 5.30 p.m. Thank They're you, Councilor Lestro. Appreciate it. Uh, just put him down. That's uh, It's <laughs> in the charter that I could assign him that, so. <laughs> All right, and the last- Thank you, Steve. Last one is the Environmental Resources Ad Hoc Committee, where we have Councilmember Garcia, Gonzalez, and Torres on there currently. I believe okay. our last meeting was canceled. Uh, so this really is as an as needed basis. Okay. We just want to do just. Uh, you, 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 can, you can put me down. Okay. Put me, yeah. Thanks. All right. 
And that's it. So let me go ahead and get a first and second on all those um, changes in. Mayor? Yes, Council Member Preciado. I don't know if anybody is available, but um, I had brought this up before, but they just, I was told to just kind of leave it and it wasn't going to really make it much of a difference. Um, I'm also on the PVTA and it, and, and we, and it's a, it's a time conflict with PVPA. So the Pomona Valley Transportation Authority meets at the same time as the Pomona Valley Protection Agency. So if, I don't know if anybody wants to take the Pomona Valley Transportation Authority um, seat from me. Uh, I know Council Member Garcia has been doing, uh, I believe she's the chair at the moment. So which one are you talking about? Uh, Pomona Valley Transportation. So, so since Liz has spoken, uh, she will uh, <laughs> take on that responsibility. Which one are we talking about, Mayor? Just uh, you're going to be uh, you're going to be uh, an alternative. The, the CEO, of the, uh, Pomona Valley Transit Authority. Pomona Valley Transit. They meet weekly for three hours <laughs> via Zoom. It's for the get about services, uh, Council Member um, Cole. It's you only have to show up if I can't. Okay. Yes, Mary, you, have my, you, have my full, you have my full support, okay? Okay, so what is it again? I'm sorry. It's on page five of your um, roster, council member. It's the Pomona Valley Transportation Authority. You know, the... Um... Okay. All righty, thank you. We appreciate you stepping up there. You're okay. welcome. All right, let's go ahead and get a motion to approve the recommendations to the changes to boards and commissions and ad hocs. Can I get a motion? Motion to approve. Can I get a second? Okay, Council Member Garcia seconded the motion and can I get a roll call? Roll call, Council Member Preciado? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Councilor Cole? Yes. Mastro? Yes. Uh, yes, but I just wanted to say one thing. Just wanted to say that we're um, glad to see Rubio Gonzalez removed from his uh, formerly appointed leadership positions in the city. Um, much like, just for the residents to understand, um, you know, Rubio Gonzalez, I considered him to be a very influential council member. Um, he had been appointed to many leadership positions um, by the council. Um, and, you know, much like how he was placed into the school district, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's just, it's a relief to see him removed and uh, to see his pay being removed. Um, I know there was a comment earlier by the city attorney that um, all he has is this title, but I think that this right here shows that he was getting paid and he's still getting paid. And for what I understand, he's still receiving salaries uh, and health care. Um, so uh, this is a first step to removing him from his leadership positions given to him by the city. I'm glad to see him, um, you know, the city disassociating themselves from him. So I am a yes vote on this. All right. Okay, and Mayor Sandoval. Yes. All right. If we can move on to the next item. Item is public hearing item number 18, approving and adopting the revised five-year permanent local housing allocation plan and authorizing submittal to the California Department of Housing and Community. I'm sorry, community development requesting funding for up to $6,410,670 over a five-year period. Okay, and uh, do we have any speakers on this item? We do not, Mayor. Okay, and do we have a presentation, staff presentation? Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the council. I don't have a presentation, but I did want to let you know that um, the council actually voted on the, uh, authorized the adoption of this, uh, um, the permanent local housing allocation plan on May 18th uh, for submission to the housing and community development um, uh, department. And um, after, receiving it, they provided staff with some feedback and that's why it's before you again tonight to uh, provide the revisions that they gave us. Um, 
most specifically, they wanted more information directed at um, what we were going to be doing with the funding, not generalities, but more specifics for each of the years. So that's what you have before you tonight. Okay, thank you, Benita. All right, at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing. I know that we don't have any speakers, so I'm gonna close the public hearing and ask the council to weigh in. Councilmember Torres, we'll start with you. Any questions, comments? No comment. Uh, Councilmember Lestro. No comment, sir. And Councilmember Anaveros Cole. I'm sorry, Mayor. No comment. Okay, Councilmember Garcia. No comment, Mayor. And Councilmember Preciado. Uh, no comment. Alrighty, can I get a motion? Move the item. And a second. second. All right, uh, I think that was Councilmember Garcia did the second. Uh, if we can do the roll call, Rosalia. Roll call is uh, Councilmember Preciado. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Yes. Castro. Yes. Torres. Yes. And Mayor Sandoval. Yes. Next item. Next item is item number 19. It's a public hearing amending the consolidated plan the fiscal year 2020-2021 annual action plan and the fiscal year 2020-2021 city operating budget by increasing revenue estimates and appropriations for CARES Act, COVID-19, funding for community development block grant, CDBGCB and Emergency Solutions Act, ESGCB funds. Thank you, uh, is there a presentation? Um, there is not a presentation, but uh, tonight basically what we're looking at is a reallocation of the funds we received in fiscal year 1920 that were unspent of the Community Development Block Grant CARES Act and Emergency Solution CARES Act funding. So it's basically bringing it forward for the uses that we had originally. Um, and then we are also allocating the new source of funding, the Emergency Solutions Act CV2. Um, which is the $6 million um, of the CARES Act. And this is bringing it into the budget. The specifics, um, if there's any awards or anything like that, will be brought back to city council um, or go through the purchasing process. Thank you, Maria. Um, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and open up the, open the public hearing. Uh, Rosalie, do we have any speakers? No speakers, Mayor. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and close the public hearing. Uh, and then now open it up to the council to weigh in. Uh, Councilmember Preciado? No comment. Uh, Councilmember Garcia? No comment, Mayor. Councilmember Ronaveros Cole? No comment, Mayor. Councilmember Valestro? Nothing, Mr. Mayor. And Councilmember Torres? No comment. All righty, very good. Can I get a motion? Motion to move. Okay, motion to approve. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, Councilmember Garcia, roll call. Uh, Councilmember Preciado. Yes. 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 Cole. Yes. Castro. Yes. Torres. Yes. And Mayor Sandoval. Yes. Thank you. Next item. Next item are matters initiated by the city council members. Items for future city council consideration as requested by the mayor or members of the city council. Okay, we'll start with council member Torres. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to report that I'm um, continuing to have um, some issues off of, um, I believe it's a uh, Cove Crest uh, way between um, Drake and um, Grove. Um, some illegal dumping that continues to take place um, I think that what the city needs to consider, hopefully, because this is becoming an issue where we're having to spend a lot of money, um, is obviously we must place some type of um, no dumping signs if the city has those available to place those up on that particular street. And um, secondary, if we can get some type of, I don't know if we can get some type of letter to um, some of the housing developments in that area. Now, I'm not saying that they're particularly responsible for some of the uh, illegal dumping taking place there, but it'd be nice if the city could send them a letter, um, I don't know, requesting to work with them in terms of how to address this issue. Um, because it seems that when residents leave that area or vacate either an apartment or a particular housing, and I understand times are hard, but nevertheless, um, 
anytime there's a vacancy, there's an illegal dumping taking place almost every other week. And it's a cost of the city, obviously. But um, if there's a way that we could sit down and work with the um, adjacent um, housing development, that would be great. And then second, second, uh, thirdly, um, you know, if I can get some type of update back on the, um, the uh, project room key, um, just some information back. I know the city staff said that they were looking to uh, get some revenue and, and whatnot. And, and um, I just wanted to see if I can get an update on that um, and just see what the status is. Uh, fourth, and I'm sorry to keep giving you all this stuff, but it's very important because I'm getting literally dozens of messages on social media like every week. The homeless shelter. What is the status of the homeless shelter in terms of um, COVID-19? I'm getting messages from residents who are asking me, um, what is the city doing to ensure that people are not, you know, leaving the area or, you know, um, and I know that there's uh, the city's taking precaution, taking precaution, but um, if you could kind of remind me, reiterate what the current status is, that way I could get that information out to the community and kind of hopefully um, ease some, some, some of the tensions out there. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Westro. No items tonight, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Rana Rose Cole. Yes, uh, Mayor. Uh, the, the concern again uh, regarding vendors, um, I have constituents calling me. There is a location on the corner of Granada and Indian Hill. I, I went down there and witnessed it for myself. What it is, it's a, uh, uh, I don't know if it's Taco Leon, I don't know who it is, but um, the constituent, Mrs. Rivera, said that um, it's right there by her house on the corner. And it is a, has become a public nuisance. The traffic is really bad. There was a car that was parked on the corner. So when you make a right hand turn onto Indian Hill, there's no way you can park. People are using the, the curve of the corner. They're parking in the alleys. They're leaving grease on the sidewalks. Uh, they have to keep their windows closed because the smoke of the cooking goes into their home. It's just a big mess. I had a call, um, uh, well, I left a message with, um, you know, an email with, um, with our city manager along with our supervisor and also sent um, uh, various calls over to the police, hopefully that they would get these people who are illegally parked. It's gonna cause an accident. Uh, a dog was killed. There was a dog there. I had witnessed that it had already been deceased. And the person that mentioned this and called me, Mrs. Mer Rivera, they were cooking and everything and the, and the carcass was still there. How are we supposed to enforce this? I mean, we have to be very careful. And so I am really urging that the um, uh, Los Angeles County Health Department is notified Hugo, the supervisor, sent me an email. He said that they were backed up, that they had other cities to take care of. But you know what? Our city counts too. So we really need to push on the Los Angeles County Health Department to come out and start doing their job for, for the city of Pomona. So um, what are we going to do about these vendors? We need to start doing something. Three of them were on Holt Boulevard and they were called out and they said they had permits. Really? Well, what about the brick and mortar? They're the ones that are losing money. They're, they are paying all kinds of uh, insurance and permits and licenses and rent. And yet these other people can come and sit right on the corner and make money and take the revenue that, I mean, are we really making any money off of these things? No, we're not. So. We need to enforce this, and that is my comment tonight. Councilwoman Garcia. Good evening, Mayor. Um, I too have noticed an increase of illegal dumping, and I would like to ask city staff if they can recall the last time we notified residents about the bulky item pickup. Um, my own family has been doing the uh, Corona purge and getting rid of things, and I know that there is a $25 charge when you ask for more than your allotted bulk item pickup, but is there anyone on staff that can recall when's the last time we sent out a notice with our water bill? 
Uh, I don't don't recall the last time that happened. Considering that there is an increased amount of uh, illegal dumping, is there any way that we can get a notice out to remind residents that they do get six free bulky item pickups per year? Um, I would actually like to talk to staff about the limit of one per billing period and the use it or lose it. But I will bring that up with city manager on our weekly meeting. But if we could work on that, the bill insert, I would really appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman Garcia. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. Uh, Councilman Bresciello? Uh, None at this time. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Uh, The cue that I have is I I was starting to give some information uh, earlier about the event on Saturday. It's July 25th uh, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And it's uh, organized by LA Care and the Blue Shield Promise Community Resource Center, which was the old Big Five on Holt Avenue from 9 to 12 p.m. Uh, they will be providing uh, back to school gear. It'll, so I understand they'll be receiving a free backpack and school supplies and, for the kids. And they will also receive a bag of assorted groceries uh, as well. And uh, so just uh, just so you know, it's uh, that is happening this Saturday. And then the second thing is, uh, and this is probably for you, Anita, I've, I've received some emails regarding vinyl windows in uh, District 1 in the Wilton Heights area. And uh, I mean, I have some idea as to what the issue uh, what the issues are. Um, I understand there's some ticketing that may be happening or some fines. I'd like to just get some, just kind of an update on that. Um, and it doesn't have to be, um, uh, I mean, I, I can certainly just give you a call, uh, but just, I just want to just uh, put that on your radar. Just want to have a better sense of what's going on there. Uh, Cause I know there's some people that are financially hurting right now and they're a little, uh, they're, they're concerned about their ability to, uh, to, to manage, um, the requirements uh, of, of being in the historic districts. So I just wanted to put that out there. I don't have any other uh, things to add at this time. Uh, so I will look at my notes here and we will adjourn to a regular meeting on Monday, August 3rd, 2020 via teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. post session items will be discussed at 5.30 p.m. and the open session will commence at 7 p.m. Thank you everyone and uh, have a good night.